All right, gentlemen, looks like we are live. And I want to welcome our audience to tonight's show. My name is Donnie, and I am your host and moderator for this much-anticipated debate on the Assumption of Mary. It is an absolute privilege, an absolute pleasure to be here with so many great guests. I have four experienced, four seasoned debaters to engage this important topic. Taking the affirmative tonight, I have William Albrecht and Sam Shamoon. And in the negative, I have Dan Chapa and Turretin Fan. Gentlemen, it really is great to have you all here for what I would say is this summer's main event. And so why don't we get acquainted? Let's break the ice a little bit before we get into the showdown itself. And I'd like to start with the affirmative side tonight, as it is uh, William and Sam Shamoon's first time here on the Standing for Truth deba debate platform. So I, I really want to thank you both for being willing to uh, join me here for a debate. So, gentlemen, let's just kind of break the ice. William, let's start with you, my man. You know, a little bit about yourself and a little bit about what you do and, and your channel. Nothing special about me. Just defend the faith and debate um and and uh you're looking good donnie i'm intimidated you're looking pretty big there <laughs> hey i'm not i'm not benching quite 450 like you william but i appreciate it you'll get there though one of these days one of these days well william i appreciate it i really am excited for this and i do want to thank you all again just for giving us your time for this uh, it really is a much anticipated debate. It looks like between all the channels, we've already got close to a thousand people. So Are you kidding <laughs> this, me? Will, this will be a debate to remember. So uh, Sam, good uh, to have you as well. Uh, yeah. How are you? A little bit about yourself and a little bit about your channel. Yeah, well, by the grace of Lord Jesus Christ, I just want to say uh, I highly recommend your channel when it comes to refuting Mac Revolution. I praise God for the work you've done. And we need people like you to show that macro evolution is not scientific and it's not biblical. So I pray the Lord will preserve you and use you mightily in that endeavor. Amen. To save minds. Now, I think a lot of the people know who I am. I'm a, a Syrian Christian apologist that's on a journey towards the ancient churches. And so this is an honor that William would think that I'm qualified to join him on a topic that I'm still a novice, but by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, I enjoyed the last discussion I had with uh, Dan Chapa and Turretin fan. He's actually professional. He's one of the most humble <clears throat> apologists I've met there. Um, I've met, and he's always, always Christ-like. And I pray I can reciprocate because being Middle Eastern, we came out of our mother's wombs angry. So hopefully by the grace of Jesus, I will reciprocate that love and be very patient. And we trust the spirit to use us, to guide us to the fullness of the truth, because that's what we all want, obviously. I don't believe something that I think is false because that would be stupid. Yeah. I believe something because I believe it's true and it honors the Lord. Likewise with Dan Chapa and Turretin fans. So may the Holy Spirit sanctify us and destroy my pride. If I'm wrong, may he show me for the glory of Jesus Christ, not for the praise of men. So that's that's me. And by the way, I think of all the bald guys, I think I'm the best looking of the three. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, hey, I like that. We'll have a second debate on that very that, that very important question, Sam. There you go. And who's got the biggest biceps, too. So uh, <laughs> I appreciate the great intro, uh, Sam and William. This is this is pretty epic. So to the audience, if you want to see more from Sam, you want to see more from William, I do have the relevant links to their channels in the uh, description box of this video. And so again, thank you for the introductions. Gentlemen, uh, four true professionals here tonight to engage the topic of the Assumption of Mary. So, okay, we're gonna uh, now hand it over to uh, the negative side for tonight, Turton fan, uh, fan and Dan Chapa. I appreciate uh, you gentlemen as well, giving us your time for this. And so let's just kind of get acquainted. Turton, why don't we start with you? Uh, definitely not your first time here on uh, Standing for Truth, but how have you been? A little bit about yourself and a little bit about uh, the channel that, that you and Dan share. Thanks very much. Yes, I'm doing well. I am a reformed blogger and debater. I've been doing both those things for about uh, the last 15 years or so under this uh, pseudonym, obviously, Turton Fan. It's not on my birth certificate. 
the uh, in those 15 years, I've done a lot of debates with William. So I'm looking forward to yet another one. In fact, I think we've debated this topic at, at least two, maybe more than two other times. I think maybe three. I think so, yeah. Yeah, I think, yeah. So looking forward to this. And then uh, as well, I do have a YouTube channel where we have con what I call Conversations in Calvinism with my friend Dan, who is not a Calvinist, despite rumors to the constant rumors to the country. Mm -hmm. All right, Turretin, I appreciate that. Uh, with you and Dan as well, I do have your uh, channel linked in the description box for anybody in the audience who wants to see uh, more from you gentlemen. And you're right. I've seen, we were talking about this backstage, Turretin and William, I've seen debates uh, between you gentlemen going back, you know, seven, eight, and over 10 years. So, but this one, this is going to be the debate to rule them all. There so you I go. appreciate, I am I am pumped for you're this. Really uh, just <laughs> Uh, really Dan Chapa, it. Yeah, it, 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 that's what I'm here for, to hype uh, hype this debate up. I don't know if it needs any more hype. There's a lot of excitement. So, Dan, Dan Chapa, looks like you're in the same room as Turretin, or you guys have a identical-looking uh, debate <laughs> room, so very cool. Dan, how are you tonight? A little bit about yourself and a little bit about uh, what you do. do uh, doing great. Yeah, thanks again for having me back on and just been looking forward to this discussion, guys, you know. Um, yeah, and I just copy and pasted, you know, uh, Turn Fan's bookcase. That's uh, that's all that is. <laughs> so, um, you know, for me, this debate—it's a debate, but it's 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 quite personal. Obviously, um, just with my family background and my heritage and everything like that, you know, just to make it through the holidays or any family get together, I'm going to have to explain it. I mean, the vast majority of my family is is Roman Catholic. I, you know, I have a cousin. My closest cousin when I was growing up is a Roman Catholic priest. Um, wow. You know, from 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 a you know kind of a Hispanic heritage, it's almost like we're the only ones you know. So we we had to know why we were not Roman Catholic from you know from the get go uh, from very early on. So this means quite a bit to me. Um, I have been studying it. I I defer to these gentlemen as the experts, but at the same time, I I feel like I put in some time and effort, and hopefully, I have something to contribute here. So I've been looking forward to this. Dan, if you don't mind me picking your brain, are you Hispanic? Yes, that's right. Yeah. I'm I'm Los Español. Yeah, yeah, I do. Really? Uh, I mean, Impressive. so, so I tech te te Tex-Mex, you know. Uh, so yeah, yeah, we, yeah. We, okay. we, we switch in the middle of a sentence. Yeah, very uh, good though. Very that. good. Just to let you know, you and I are in the same camp. We're all learning this. This is something new to you and me. So they're the experts. We're learning. So we're gonna have to follow their lead. But remember, all my exes are in Texas. <laughs> <laughs> Gentlemen, yeah, Dr. Evil, I appreciate that, Sam. Um, <laughs> uh, gentlemen, great introductions from all of you. I appreciate us getting acquainted before we get into the debate itself, where you're all going to bring the heat tonight. You're going to give us a debate to, to remember. So again, to the audience, please, if you want to see more from our guests tonight, they've been gracious with uh, their time. Please do check the description box. And also... Uh, we got a heavy format tonight, so I'm really going to be focused on the debate. I am going to be focused on the format, making sure that everything's organized. I want to give you all a good debate tonight. These debates are to edify the, the body of Christ. And so I've got all my chat mods. They are going to make sure that everybody in uh, tonight's live chat is respectful. Please be respectful, be cordial to all of our guests tonight. They have given us their time for, for tonight's debate. And if they haven't given us their time, we wouldn't have this debate. So please be respectful. If you're going to attack anything, attack arguments and not uh, the debaters themselves. And I am, uh, I've got my full confidence in my uh, veteran chat mods for that. And so, okay, with all the formalities out of the way, gentlemen, let's just all get into uh, the debate itself. And we've got the first opening statement. The first opening statement will be from the uh, affirmative side and it'll be Sam Shamoon. So Sam, whenever you're By ready, way, you just, sure. Yeah, Don, just, uh, just give me like 10 minutes, is it? And then, because I still don't know the format. So it's 10 minutes and then they go 10 minutes and then cross or sorry, I didn't, because I still don't know the format. I apologize. Oh, that's okay. No worries. Leave that up to me. So yeah, we'll have 10 minute uh, opening from you. I'll, uh, I'll I'll give you you know a, a one or two minute warning when you reach the eight or nine minute mark, and then uh, we're going to jump right into a ten minute cross exam. Okay. And okay. so uh, one of the negative side will be cross okay. exam. Actually, specifically, it'll be Dan. Dan, you'll be doing the first cross exam. So 
you got it. All right, Jen, okay. you, you let me know when to begin because I don't have a timer, so I'll just trust your lead. So should I yes, begin? I'll, I'll take care of the time. Sam, the floor is yours. You've got All 10 right. minutes. Go ahead. Praise be the God and Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I do beseech the Holy Spirit to sanctify this debate, sanctify our motives, and constrain us for the glory of Jesus Christ. And save us all from misspeaking and misinterpreting scripture. So I trust in the spirit. We all do. May the Lord Jesus be glorified. No praise to us. Obviously, my brothers will know that the primary text that is going to be used from scripturally Revelation 12. So I look forward to the objections because at one time I used the same objections against this interpretation, but I've changed my position. Revelation 12, if you read verses 117, and because my time is fleeting, I can't go in depth. But if you pay attention, Revelation 12, verses 1 to 17, this is what you would call a multi-layered <clears throat> symbolism in which you have a great sign in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and our head, um, on her head a crown of 12 stars. She was with child, and she cried out in her pangs of birth and anguish for delivery. Now, there's a lot to unpack, but just real quickly, we see that in scripture, oftentimes you'll have an individual or even a group that becomes a picture of something else. For example, John is heavily <clears throat> reliant and dependent on the Old Testament. Here, he alludes to Genesis chapter 3, verses 14 to 16, Genesis chapter 37, verses 5 to 11. He also alludes to Jeremiah 4, verse 31. Isaiah 66, 17 to 24, also Isaiah 7, 10 to 14, but he also alludes to Matthew chapter 1 and 2, which again, if we have time, we'll unpack. In other words, the woman isn't just one person per se. It starts out with Eve, who then becomes a picture of Israel, who then is typified, personified in Mary, and by extension, the church. That it definitely includes Mary, I'll seek to demonstrate and seek to answer the objections that are raised. Now, let me just read some more of it so we can see that Mary is involved in the symbolism. And it's not unique to Mary. You'll find that even in Revelation, what is said about the child, because here, Psalm 2, verses 8 to 9, is applied specifically to the male child, that the male child is the fulfillment of Psalm 2. But interestingly, Psalm 2, verses 8 to 9, is then applied to the church in Revelation 2, 26 to 28, because that's how symbolism functions. It'll point to an individual who then typifies a group, and that group will be personified in an individual. Lord willing, I'll seek to demonstrate that. But let me just read a little further. And another portent appeared in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems upon his heads. His tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to bear a child that he might devour her child when she brought it forth. She brought forth a male child, one who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron, but her child was cut up to God and to his throne. So right there, here's the reference, the allusion to Psalm 2.8 which is also then applied to the church of Jesus Christ in Revelation 2, 26 to 28. Now, no one denies that the male child most obviously is the Lord. But as I stated, it's not just the Lord. It's the Lord in union with his church. We'll elaborate that. So now, is there evidence that this woman is also Mary? Because my argument goes like this. Eve, picture of Israel, personified in Mary. So it's not either or, it's all of the above. Yes, there's evidence to show that it is Mary. And we can talk about the objections later on. Here we go. What's some of the evidence? Revelation 12, verse 1 to 2. Let's look at it one more time. Now, again, for the sake of time, I can't go in depth. Hopefully, in the cross-examination, we can then <clears throat> flesh it out. Revelation 12, 1 to 2. Now, a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of 12 stars. Then, being with child, she cried out in labor and in pain to give birth. Now, this is actually an allusion to Isaiah 7, 10 to 14. A great sign appeared in heaven. A woman. What's interesting here is that the Hebrew terms used in Isaiah 7, 14, ha-alma. Literally, alma means woman. But in the context of the Hebrew Bible, alma, in the context of the Hebrew Bible, refers to a young woman of marriageable age who is a virgin. 
So it is a virgin, but technically the term Alma means woman. But in that context, she's a virgin of marriageable age. And it's interesting because Alma, literally woman, though by extension a virgin, and then a sign, ask for a sign in heaven or in Sheol. And now let's pick it up in Isaiah 7, 10 to 14 to see that when John says a great sign appeared to heaven, a woman with child, this is an allusion to Isaiah 7. So I'm going to read Isaiah 7, 10 to 14. Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz. Ask a sign of the Lord your God. Let it be deep as Sheol or as high as heaven. But Ahaz said, I will not ask and I will not put the Lord to the test. Excuse me. And he said, hear then, O house of Israel or house of David. It is too little for you to weary men that you weary my God also. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Adonai will give you a sign. Behold, a young woman. I'm using translation that renders it as a young woman, like Revised Standard Version. You even have New English translation that translates it similarly. But again, I'm not saying this is not a virgin. In the context of the Bible, this young woman is a virgin. She can't be otherwise. And there wouldn't be something miraculous of a young woman conceiving naturally. A young woman shall conceive and bear a son. And she'll call his name Emmanuel. And obviously, we then see that in Matthew 1, 18 to 23, Mary is the fulfillment. So let me read it. I don't know how much time I have, but you'll let me know. <clears throat> now, the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph before they came together, she was found to be with child of the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to send her away quietly. But as he considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son. You shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and his name shall be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. So we know that Mary fulfills Isaiah 7, 14. And we see that in Isaiah 7, 10 to 14, a sign as high as heaven, a woman conceives. And that's, again, alluded to in Revelation 12, verses 1 to 2. And then in 4 and 5, we're told that her male child was destined to rule the nations with a rod of iron. Well, that's Psalm chapter 2, verse 8, as well as 9. And according to the New Testament, in Acts 13, 32 to 33, and Hebrews 1, 5, Psalm 2-7 is actually applied to Jesus' post-resurrection and ascension into heaven where he sits enthroned as a messianic king and heir of the throne of David. So who is the woman that literally gave birth to Messiah? The Blessed Mother. Now, to further illustrate the point that you can have an image that refers to multiple entities, once again, notice it says the woman gave birth in labor pains. That's Genesis 3, 14 and 15. But then it says the woman is clothed with 12 stars and the sun and moon under her feet. Well, now it goes from Eve to being the nation of Israel, being the nation of Israel. Why? Because this Two is- Two minutes now. Okay. Thank you, brother. This is a reference to Genesis 37, 9 to 11. Joseph has a dream in which he sees the sun and moon, 11 stars bowing to him. And then Jacob says, what shall- your mother and I and your 11 brothers bow down to you. So there is no denying that it goes from Eve, who then becomes a picture of Israel. But then Israel is personified in the Blessed Mother. Why? Because you'll find throughout Scripture where God refers to the inhabitants of Jerusalem or Judah as daughter of Jerusalem, virgin daughter of Zion. The Lord is with you. For example, Lamentations 2.13. What can I say for you? To what compare you, O daughter of Jerusalem? What can I liken you liken to you that I may comfort you, O virgin daughter of Zion? So we find in the Old Testament references to the virgin daughter of Zion, <clears throat> the daughter of Judah, and the promise that the Lord will be in her midst and with her. For example, Zephaniah 3, 14 and 17. Sing aloud, O daughter of Zion. <clears throat> Exult your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The King of Israel, the Lord is in your midst. Zechariah 2, 7 to 12, speaking of daughter of Zion. <clears throat> I come and will dwell in the midst of thee, and I will dwell in the midst of thee. So here we read that the virgin daughter of Zion, virgin daughter of Judah, has the Lord with her and in her. 
This is literally fulfilled in the Blessed Virgin because she is the virgin daughter of Judah. And all right, I stop. Is that my time up? No, no, you still got 30 seconds, Sam. Oh, I'm sorry. I missed your kid. Literally, she is the literal virgin daughter of Judah. She's the literal virgin daughter of Zion, of Jerusalem. And we see not only is the Lord with her, but he's literally in her. That's why Elizabeth, filled with the Holy Spirit, says, What honors this that the mother of my Lord should come to me? Luke 1, 41 to 43. So she's literally the virgin daughter of Judah, the virgin daughter of Zion. And she literally had the Lord in her, tabernacling in her, becoming flesh from her. So she personifies Israel. My time is up, but we'll expand on it later. Sam, I appreciate the uh, first 10 minute opening for tonight's debate. Gentlemen, we're now moving into a 10 minute cross exam. This will be the negative side leading the way, specifically Dan Chapa. And so Dan, Does that mean yeah. I'm the one who's gonna answer, not William, just me. That's right. Yep. So, okay. Sam, you'll be the one answering. What I'll do is put the other Steve guests William. back. Thanks back for setting stage me up. So there's not too much commotion, and it'll be uh, me as moderator and our two uh, okay. debaters for this specific cross exam. So, whenever you're ready, Dan, 10 minutes. Go ahead. Thank you, Donnie. And uh, thank you, Sam. Uh, appreciated your, your uh, exposition of Romans or uh, Revelation 12. So, um, you you have to forgive me, but I am much more familiar with the Roman Catholic view than your own on this topic in general. So can you explain to me from your church's point of view and your personal point of view, um, do you are you like the Roman Catholics in that it's it's a dogma? If you deny it, you're anathematized, all that stuff? Or is this yes, a kind of... I a, would know. A thing? I, well, you're asking me uh, what the Catholic Church teaches on that. Like I said, I'm on a journey. I don't know much. William will be more qualified to address it. But as for me personally, you're asking me yeah, is it a, is it a dogma or is it take it or leave it? Uh, well, if you're asking me, I don't know if I'd answer it in that way. I would say that if someone is not convinced exegetically of its teaching, because even the Catholic Church, you have something called invincible ignorance. So that if someone is not convinced exegetically, God has mercy. This is why even the Catholic Church, Protestants are said to be separated brethren. But if someone knows this to be true, and faithful to the text of scripture and the teaching of Christians and still rejects it, that's a different story. So in my view is if you are not convinced, I do believe God has mercy. Okay. Thank you for clarifying. Yeah. yeah. So, okay. So let's get into the, um, yeah, the revelation text. 12. So, okay. If, if I understood you correctly, you're saying the woman is Eve, then Mary, then the church, then Israel. So, Let's take for the sake of argument that that's the case, that Eve is at, at sometimes in different aspects, the church, Israel, Mary, and, and all these things. Let me clarify that. Even if I, if I clarify it. Was, so oh, I clarify okay. yeah, said, please please say, and then I'll to my question. Yeah, go ahead. Again? No, because I want to clarify what you said. I said that Eve is a shadow of Israel because if you read the text, there's no denying he's referencing Genesis 3, 14 and 15. That's the woman. And it's in context, it's Eve. But then he extends it to Israel because of Genesis 37, 9, and 11. So it's not, let's say, that's the exegetical meaning. But go ahead. Well, well, I might disagree with that. But let's say you're right for the sake of argument, for the sake of discussion. Okay, so the, the woman is um, Eve, the church, Israel, and Mary. Okay, where's the bodily assumption in this text? Where is Mary going yes. to heaven? Because... It says that this woman is in heaven, meaning that she's destined to reign in heaven like her son. For example, when her son is born, if you read the text carefully, the son is destined to rule on the father's throne in heaven. There's no denying that in the context, this imagery of heaven shows this is what they're destined for. Obviously, <clears throat> Mary was not in heaven before she gave birth to the son. So why is she depicted in heaven? And why is the sun depicted in heaven? Because this is John's way of showing they are destined to reign in heaven. This is how we get that Mary's assumed to rule with her son. She's the queen mother. So, so in the text, it talks about her giving birth and birth travail. Sure. Do you agree that that happened on earth or did that happen in heaven? Of course it did happen on earth. Okay, so then how do you get from earth to heaven? Just through some, yeah, because some of the or? text. 
I, I answer that, Dan, if you were listening, I'm just saying that to listen because I answered your objection. Just like the sun was born on earth and then ascended to heaven, but the, in the imagery, we see that she and the sun are already in heaven. So what does that mean symbolically? It means though she gives birth to him on earth, still the fact that she's in heaven means this is what she's destined for, like her son was destined to reign. Because you and I both agree, and I don't think you deny this, Jesus was born to rule as the heir of David. But when did he rule? When he went to heaven. So if we're going to be consistent and we're going to uh, interpret it consistently, if he's destined to reign in heaven, that means the woman, because she's in heaven, means that's her destiny. That's where she'll end up eventually. And any view you take, you're going to have to answer that problem because if it's Israel, well, Israel's depicted in heaven, but we know Israel's on earth and the church is on earth. But go ahead. Okay, so let's uh, let's bound the time frame for this destiny. Is this destiny after the end of her life on earth and before the general resurrection of Jesus? all believers? You mean Jesus? So Mary's destiny. So you're, I, if I understand you correctly, and, yes. and correct me if I'm if I'm misspeaking, you're saying that this talk, text, even though it's talking about earthly events, is talking about her heavenly destiny. When is that heavenly destiny? Is it? after mary dies and then before um the general after resurrection she's in, taken other words, in other words yeah, I mean, if you heard, I, Dan, I, you heard what i said if you heard what i said just like jesus yes, when did he what was that yeah yeah i've heard you so i'm asking this yeah i'm question. answering it so if you let me answer i will okay, okay. just like jesus began reigning when he left the earth that means if we're going to be consistent exegetically she too, when she exits the earth, will start reigning with him as the queen mother because there's other elements in Revelation that shows that he has the key to the Davidic dynasty, Revelation 3, 7, 8. And part of the Davidic heir is that he reigns and he honors his mother as the queen mother. So that means if I'm going to be consistent with the context, just like Jesus began reigning when he left the earth, she too would reign as queen mother when she leaves the earth. So what text what verse are you referring to that says that mary or even implies that mary's reign starts as soon as she leaves this earth because in the scriptures we're told that we who are believers we reign with christ and ephesians 2 6 says ephesians to answer your question it says that right now positionally we are seated at the right hand of god how much more when we leave the earth so unless you're denying that mary's in heaven reigning with her son i think it's common sense exegetically that if we Take what the Bible says, Ephesians 2, 6. We believers in Christ are already seated in the heavenly places with Christ. That's positionally. That means when I leave this world, then I will <clears throat> be with Christ, reigning with Christ from heaven. How much more his blessed mother who is the queen mother? Do you believe in the bodily assumption of all believers prior to the end no. times? No, it doesn't and say why. That then why are you believing in Mary's bodily assumption prior to the end time? What passage are you looking to? Well, it, it's it's because I see how Christians have understood Revelation 12 and how they have understood like the Dormition, which will come up, I guess, a little later. Because Christians who have been reading the scriptures, commenting on the scriptures, exegeting scriptures, saw that when Mary is taken, she wasn't just taken in her spirit, but her body and spirit. So by extension, if she is in heaven, that means she's reigning. But if the church was led on the basis of their understanding of scripture, that she's now their bodily, that means she's reigning bodily. So which church fathers taught that the woman in Revelation 12 is Mary, if any? Oh, yeah, I have some. Yes. Hold on. One, one second. Okay. Let me get through. Yeah, I got a couple of them. And you understand, and I'm sure you know this, and I need to teach you this, that Revelation, its canonicity, was disputed. And therefore, until it was finalized, we're not going to expect too many commentaries in relation, but identity of the woman. But let me just get you my file. One second. I have it up. I even have it. I just posted it where you have Christians saying that Mary is assumed in heaven. But let me just give me a second. Let me get it for you, if you don't mind. Sure. Right. Let me just get it. Here you go. All right. All right. Let's go to one second. Sorry, I got a lot of quotes. I'm just trying to get. Well, no, let me go to Revelation 12, the commentaries, because that will be relevant as well. One second. Here we go. And by the way, I have Protestant commentaries that acknowledge that it is Mary, or at least it typifies Mary. Here, 
I'm going to give you quad volt dus di symbolo 430 AD, his commentary on Revelation 12. None of you is ignorant of the fact that the dragon was the devil. The woman signified the Virgin Mary. The woman signifies Mary. So at least he's saying it is Mary, right? But now let's go to the assumption. Let me go to my article and say, sorry, I'm a little unprofessional, but I'm trying with the time allotted to us. Epiphanius is just one. In his section 79 of Panarian, AD 370, like the bodies of the saints, however, she has been held in honor for the, her character and understanding. And if I should say nothing, anything more in her praise, she is like Elijah, who was virgin from his mother's womb, always remained so, and was taken up, but has not seen death. So Elijah is being likened to Mary in her virginity and her assumption. This is 370 AD, section 79 on the Panarian. Now, Timothy of Jerusalem, homily on Simeon and Anna. Therefore, the virgin is immortal to this day, seeing that he who had dwelt in her transported her to the regions of her assumption. Pseudo John, the theologian, AD 400. The Lord said to his mother, let your heart rejoice and be glad. For every favor and every gift has been given to you from my Father in heaven and from me and from the Holy Spirit. Every soul that calls you, calls upon your name, shall not be ashamed, but shall find mercy and comfort and support and confidence, both in the world that now is and in that which is to come, in the presence of my Father in heavens. And from that time forth, all knew that the spotless, precious body has been transferred to paradise. In case you missed, let me read it again. And from that time forth, all knew that the spotless, precious body had been transferred to paradise. Do you want me to give you some more? Because I got more. And, no, and actually, I'm going to jump in, gentlemen, because, Dan, you have uh, time for one more question. So, Dan, feel free to uh, advance a follow-up question or a new question. We'll allow Sam to answer, and then we'll move on to the next phase of the debate. Okay, so the, my last question, I guess, will be um, when the dragon was pursuing the woman into the wilderness, and, and was that an event that happened on earth or in heaven? Well, according to Protestant commentaries, they say that is actually typified by Mary having to flee into Egypt. So the Protestants answer that. I have it. I can quote it to you. They say that flight to the wilderness is typified in Mary because Mary stands as a symbol for the church when she had to flee from Herod, who was an agent of Satan, to Egypt so he wouldn't devour the child because in its context, the first attempt of Satan to devour the child was when Herod ordered the slaughter of the innocents. Thank you. Okay, gentlemen. Great, cordial, first 10-minute cross-exam for tonight's debate to the live chat. It is a very lively live chat, again, between all of the channels streaming. We've got over a 1,000 people watching. And so By the way, I'm honey, doing – pardon? What's the new format? Because I have no idea. What's next now? What's no next? worries. No worries. I'll, I'll go over that oh, real quick. Oh, I do want to let the audience know, though, I see all the questions coming in, and I am all caught up. So we are good there. And the next – uh, phase of the debate will be uh, the negative side. And so that'll be uh, the Protestants and specifically, uh, let's see, Turretin fan. This is going to be your opening statement. And so you get 10 minutes. You get 10 minutes for an opening statement whenever you're ready. Is it possible for you to share my slides? It's the one that starts with 1NC. Yes. 1NC. Uh, Thanks very much. No problem. Bodily assumption of Mary, is it revealed dogma or human fable? I'll have three points tonight, the background in biblical, traditional takeouts, and responses to some assumptionist points. First, the background. The apostolic faith was once delivered, Jude 3 tells us, and it didn't include the bodily assumption of Mary. The bodily assumption of Mary is a fictional story originally developed by heretics. It's important to the cult of Mary, but it has even less connection with history than the story that President George Washington confessed to chopping down his father's cherry tree as a child. Already in the fourth century, Epiphanius provided reports of people literally worshiping Mary, and the tale of her bodily assumption can be linked to that group known as the Coloridians. In the 13th century, the golden legend of Jacobus de Varagine promoted the story along with numerous other fictional accounts of the saints, gleaned from a wide variety of sources, including Gregory of Tours, who introduced this fable to the West. The book was popular until it was debunked by Erasmus and others around the dawn of the Reformation. William and Sam 
claim that the bodily assumption happened. Why should we believe them? The general rule laid out in scripture is that everyone dies, Hebrews 9. Moreover, there will be a resurrection of the body of Christ, 1 Thessalonians 4.16 tells us. This will take place for believers at the coming of Christ, 1 Corinthians 15 tells us. Mary was a believer, in view of Acts 1, so she too will rise from the dead that day with the rest of us. Additionally, right before Jesus' death, Mary was entrusted to John, John 19, and John famously lived a long life. It's reflected in John 21. So if Mary had been assumed into heaven, John would have known about it. In fact, the fictional accounts often describe John as being there or even attribute the, John, the account to John himself, that pseudo John the theologian, that's one of these uh, authors of the fictional accounts. If John knew about the bodily assumption, the actual John, it, and if it were important for us to know, he would have written about it to us, John 20. So either it wasn't important or the fictional accounts are false and it didn't happen. Sorry, the slides text is much too small to read there, but that's the quick summary of what I was just been saying. Traditional takeouts, the slide's much too small as well, but there are three traditional reasons by which we should reject the assumption. Contradiction, unexplainable silence, and the traceable development from dicta to dogma. As to contradiction, the first are uncontroversial at the time statements by the church fathers that are contradictory to the assumption. It's noteworthy that these are Western fathers. Ambrose of Milan, who died in 397, says only Jesus has risen permanently. Caesarius of Arles, died 542, says that only at Christ's coming will any of his followers ascend to the clouds. As to silence, the most glaring silence comes from Epiphanius of Salamis, who we've heard about earlier. He died 403. He says no one knows the end of Mary. In the very next section, when he wants to compare Mary to others of high character, he picks three people, each of which had a different end of life. Elijah, who was translated, John, who passed away after prayer, and Thecla, who is usually identified as an early martyr. More could be said, but the point is fairly clear. Epiphanius was not aware of a reliable Christian tradition regarding the end of Mary. It's absolutely unbelievable that he would be unaware of this supposedly important fact about Mary if it were more than myth. Even if we didn't have his explicit statement that he hadn't heard of the end of Mary, we could figure that out from elsewhere in his writings, such as when he's talking about glorified bodies. He talks about Enoch and Elijah and even Jesus, but omits Mary from discussion. Here's where the silence becomes interesting. The papal definition of the bodily assumption is deliberately vague about where Mary died, when she died, how she died, or even whether she died. They're sure her body is in heaven, but not much more than that. Now, other churches and their traditions have different views, so I understand Sam's not necessarily bought into everything that Rome has in their de definition, but that, that's the uh, papal definition that I'm focused on. In general, the two options are that she died and rose again like Jesus, or that she was translated like Enoch or Elijah. As I mentioned, Epiphanius doesn't include her under either list. What about other patristic era authors? If Mary were translated into heaven, we would have expected Irenaeus, who died in 202, to mention her with Elijah and Enoch as an example of someone who will continue living in the body. If Tertullian, who died in 220, thought that Mary was translated into heaven, he would have needed to explain that away because he claims that everyone dies and explains Elijah and Enoch to buttress his argument. Afrahat, Ambrose, Augustine, and even the pseudonymous apostolic constitutions all oddly omit mention of Mary. Perhaps the most interesting, though, is Ephraim, the Syrian, who died in 373. The Nisabine hymns, hymn 68, lists Elijah and Enoch as exceptions to death's reign. The death character responds by identifying the exceptions as numerically two, in contrast to the many who are coming. The hymn also has death mocking the fact that Lazarus died again. If Mary were permanently resurrected, one would expect her mentioned there. But although Ephraim has many lofty things to say about Mary, he doesn't respond to death by claiming that the exceptions to death are three, not two, nor that while Lazarus has died, Mary has not, or anything like that. But what about the development from dicta to dogma? In the East, the Feast of the Dormition of Mary, 
no, her falling asleep, that's what Dormition refers to, began in the fifth or sixth centuries. This feast began then. By contrast, it was nearly the end of the seventh century when Sergius I of Rome, 687 to 701, appointed a feast of Mary's Dormition. Moreover, it wasn't until the end of the eighth century when Adrian I, 772 to 770, uh, so 795, replaced or renamed the feast with the Feast of the Assumption. Even then, holding a feast doesn't mean embracing the legend. Innocent IV counted the assumption as an opinion that could be held or not held, for the church had not yet decided. According to Carroll, uh, that's E. Carroll in uh, Carol, uh, J. Carroll's Mariology. Innocent IV came a few decades before the Golden Legend book that I mentioned earlier. Three centuries later, Pius V finally removed pseudo-Dromian writings that had cautioned an attitude of reserve towards the bodily assumption, and it snowballed from there. Further uh, people adopted this view, and eventually Pope Pius XII in 1950 defined it as a dogma. But what about some of the responses to assumptionist arguments? So I have more here, but let's see if I can just close this out. Here we are. So first of all, the scriptural arguments for the assumption are, and I don't mean this in a disrespectful way, but they're just a pretext. Even if the woman of Revelation 12, 1 is Mary, it isn't, but even if it were, even if it was a reference to Eve or an allusion to Eve, which it isn't, but even if it were, even if the man child is Jesus, which it isn't, but even if it were, and even if the woman is Mary, the woman isn't Mary, but even if it were, and even if Mary is destined to reign in heaven, as Sam's indicated here, that's not what this text is about, but even if that was the point, and even if Mary starts reigning as queen mother, whatever that means, and that's not remotely the point of this text, but even if it were, it doesn't say in Re Revelation 12 that the woman is bodily in heaven. So scripture doesn't establish this bodily assumption of Mary. Sam acknowledges that all deceased believers, all those who are sleeping in Christ, are reigning in heaven now. But Sam acknowledges as well that that doesn't require them being bodily in heaven. In short, the biblical arguments from the assumptionist side are just illustrations of people trying to read something into the text. When the scriptural argument runs out, he appeals to how Christians have understood Revelation 12. He cites Quadvolt Deus, who says the woman is Mary, but Quadvolt Deus didn't teach that Mary was bodily assumed. And, his, and that kind of teaching was absent from contemporaries of his. He also cites Epiphanius, who explicitly denies knowing the end of Mary in the section right before the one that he cites. He cites Pseudo-Timothy of Jerusalem. Pseudo-Timothy isn't a father, neither is Pseudo-John the theologian. Those are also not fathers. In short, the scriptural arguments that are used are wrong. Scripture feels free to use typology, but it also states when typology is being used. We, we're not free to just apply arbitrary typology to the text. Instead, we should read the text in context and determine what does Revelation 12 mean from the larger context. This is part of the third woe under the seventh trumpet. These are things that are to happen in the future. And when you start seeing that, the idea that this is a reference back to Mary giving birth to Jesus, if anything, if you even refer to it at all, it's just as an illustration of something that's coming up in the future. And with that, I yield back any remaining time. Okay, Turretin, that's basically 10 minutes on the dot. So I appreciate your uh, opening statement. That's the first 10 minute opening for the negative side. We're now gonna move into our next cross exam. This time it'll be uh, the affirmative side leading the way. Uh, with specifically uh, William, if I'm not uh, mistaken, uh, William, you'll be cross or is it um, is it Sam for the first? Yeah, because it was affirmative A speaker. Okay, so right. Okay. okay, yeah, yeah. So I mix that up. So we'll have uh, Sam. You'll be okay. uh, leading the way in cross exam with with sure. Turretin fan. So whenever you're, you're ready, ready, gentlemen. Let me let me interrupt one moment. How long is the cross exam, Donnie? I'm sorry. Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Right? Gotcha. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. No worries. Okay, gentlemen. So we're ready. We're good to go. Okay, yeah. Now, uh, Turretin, if I <clears throat> misrepresent your position, not deliberate, because I try to keep up, so take that into consideration. Now, you said that 
in Revelation 12, it doesn't say that the woman is bodily assumed. Now, in Revelation 12, 4 to 5, that male child that was born, can you show me where it says he was bodily assumed to the throne? Revelation 12, 4 to 5, because it's about the Christ. Because if you read Revelation 12, 4 to 5 and 10, in the text, does it say the child was taken up bodily? So there's a lot in your question loaded in there, like the idea that it is about Jesus. It it says that it's a child who's taken up there. And, if, and we know that Jesus was no longer a child when he was when he ascended into heaven. So I don't I don't accept that premise of your question. Well, let me push back, uh, because, again, the assumption is that John is giving you a strict chronology so that that when the child is born, he's caught up in heaven. But if you read verse 10, it's clearly the Christ, because the child's <clears throat> assumption into heaven is <clears throat> coinciding with the rule of Christ in verse 10 that results in Michael debarring Satan from heaven. So if you want to deny the obvious, then I can't really help you because it's a reference to Psalm 2. So are you saying that Psalm 2 is not about the Messiah? Because it's referring to Psalm 2. 8. So you say it's obvious, but church father oh, after yeah. church father says exactly the opposite of what you. does he say church father after church father says this is referring to the church and so can you show me where those church fathers say it's not christ it's the church we're not talking about the woman and we're talking about the child which church father says that's not the christ give me one well church father after church father identifies it specifically as the church okay that again uh, not asking argue from silence which church father said it's not the christ I don't have at the top of my head one that specifically says it's a church and it's not Christ. So, because if you follow what I said, Revelation 12 about Christ, but it's extended to the church because things that are said about Christ are applied to the church. Do you agree with this or no? I agree that things that are said about Christ sometimes are said about the church. I'm, what I'm rejecting is the idea that in this passage, yeah. the description is of Okay, Correct. can you read verse 10 for me then? Read verse 10. Revelation verse 10. 12. And I, I heard... A... Go ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. So when did the power of his Christ come? What is it referring to in the immediate context? It's the what it's referring to in the immediate context it is verse 9 and the great dragon was cast out that old serpent called the devil and satan which deceives the whole world he was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. That's actually the result of the child being taken to the throne because if you want to follow now chronologically when does satan get thrown out of heaven is it after the child was taken to the throne or before? Because now you want to follow a strict chronology. So chronologically where that happens is verse 7 and 8 says, and there was a war in heaven. Read 4 and 5 for me, Turnton, because you skip 4 and 5. Read 4 all the way to 9 so that people can see contextually saying this throne after the child is taken to, to the throne. Can you read it for me? I, I could read. I can read it. I love reading the so scripture. Read, I'm happy to do that. Out. So it we're, says... We're, it says, and she was, she being with the child cried, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven. And behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and 10 horns and seven crowns upon his heads. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as it was born. And she brought forth a man child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared of God that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days. And there was a war in heaven. Michael. So now, and his, can you answer this, Turton? When did the war take place? After the child went to heaven or before? It actually doesn't say okay. the timing right, of the war in heaven, it's, does it? It's, it's, yeah. Yeah. No, it actually does, but it's okay because you. You refuse to see. That's okay. Now, you said the general rule, everyone dies. But then you also mentioned the fact that there are fathers that say that Elijah and Enoch didn't die, correct? There are fathers who say that Elijah and Enoch didn't die? If I heard you correctly, did you not reference some of the writers or fathers that mentioned Elijah and Enoch 
because yeah. they didn't die, correct? Uh, they are fathers who mentioned Elijah and Enoch. Okay. Yeah. So then why would you bring up an argument that the general rule is everyone dies when you just acknowledge there are exceptions to the rule, thereby contradicting your statement? So exceptions prove a general rule. That's what it's called a general yeah. rule. Yeah. So how does the general rule refute just for argument's sake? I'm not saying it is that Mary would be an exception if you already acknowledge there are two exceptions, Elijah and Enoch. So how was that an argument in your favor? Because you made the argument I didn't. Well, you have this made up story that Mary is bodily assumed. That well, goes against that. Go, let me answer the question, please. That goes against the general rule. That goes against the general rule that scripture teaches that everyone dies. Like Elijah. You, it, the general rule that everyone dies. So if like you want Elijah. to if you if you want to establish that there's an exception, the burden is on you to establish okay. it. No, that yeah. wasn't my argument. What if you if you actually adjust my argument, not a text straw man, you don't need to get frustrated. We're brothers here. You used the general rule to prove that Mary could not have been assumed bodily, but then yep. you mentioned, okay, you used the general rule that everyone dies to prove that Mary died, right? No. Okay, repeat your argument because I'm going to give you the benefit of doubt. I misheard you. The bur the, I used it to shift the burden to you to establish that the general rule but, was violated. But anyway... People can go back and see that was not your case, but it's okay. For the sake of charity, I'll say that is. But the fact that you admit there are exceptions refutes your assumption that the general rule somehow would mitigate against my position. In fact, this goes to my other point. Did you not say that there were writers and Christians that held either to one or two views, that Mary died and was assumed or assumed, correct? I said that there are writers who say that everyone dies and that well, no one has be taken up. I'm sorry, go ahead. You were talking about the two positions regarding Mary's final days. I'm not talking about the general now. Did you not say, if I misheard you, because I couldn't see your notes, that there were two positions. One position that she died and she was assumed bodily. The other says she was just taken bodily, correct? Ah, uh, those are the, those are two different stories about the. Yeah, but that's not my question. Jordan. What I'm saying, you acknowledge that these were two views, correct? I, I only acknowledge that those are two myths. That's all I acknowledge. Yeah. Whether it's myth, but you acknowledge this was taught, and those who taught it didn't think it was myth, correct? I don't know what they thought uh, subjectively. So That's absurd. That helps those two positions. I, the, the vast majority of the people who started to teach the assumption, people like John of Damascus. So they didn't know it was true if they're teaching it? So I think that John of Damascus accepted the idea. So he on the, would be an example of someone who thought she died and rose again. So then that means your general rule got refuted because John Damascus now answers you. She did die, but then she was resurrected. So how does your general rule mitigate against that view? It, it, the general rule that everyone dies is not the rule. Died, right? That's not the general rule that's violated. The general rule that's violated by John of Damascus is that Christ's people will be raised at Christ's coming. Not according to John with Mary, because you just said he said she died, she was assumed. So John didn't imply that to Mary, right? Because I'm yeah, going by what you said. I, I totally reject what John has to say. He's, a, I, I he's not. you reject it. I want to know what he said. Do you agree he said, Turretin, listen to me. Do you agree he said she died and was taken bodily? I agree that he said that, of course. Well, that means his response shows your general rule does not apply to those who believe she died and was taken heaven. That's all I'm trying to get at. You but can't that, just that doesn't that's not a, a valid analysis because just someone you saying it, it just know. just someone asserting it, that fact that it's John of Damascus asserting that's it not my doesn't change it. You you literally just said that it is it refutes the point. No, actually that wasn't my argument, but it's okay. People the audience can discern. Now you mentioned Panary in seventy eight. And but now what do you mean for 79 Samir? as well. Yeah. No, but you first said because 79 cannot mean what it means because of 78, he was uncertain. Now in 78, that's not a close you... ca characterization of what I said. No. Okay. I'm going to be for the sake of charity. I'm going to say I misheard you. Now show me the connection between 78 and 78. Go ahead with the time remaining so I can then address you. So the connection is there one section after the other in this bread basket that he provides. One is talking about the anti dicomarians the other about the Coloridians. Yeah. So what is 78's connection with 79? Because you went with 78, but then 79, which you try to then explain away that he's not saying that 
Elijah's like Mary in that he didn't die. So in what way was he like Mary? Explain to me how Elijah's like Mary in 79. Stop shaking your head, just explain it. So we can know what your view is. I actually used it to establish my point because when he's trying to compare Mary to others, he actually picks three different people, all of whom, according to tradition, died in different ways. And what's with, the connection with Elijah and Mary? What's the connection? The, How according does to Elijah, the text, he says that about. these are people of high character. Okay. But that's not what he said because he says, it's like literally Mary, what he said. That, that's he what was, he's mentioning. I have it in front of me, Turretin. Let me read it again. So let's see. Sam, you got again. nine. You got time for one more question and then we'll. we'll All right. Well, I can. Okay. He says, like Mary, he was a virgin and did not taste death. Which part of like Mary and then mentioning the virginity test death wasn't clear for you? Okay. I mean, that's kind of an absurd question of what, what's not clear for me. But the, the answer to that question is he cites the three people who are reputed to be virgins. He cites Elijah, who is a virgin. He cites John, who is reputed to be a virgin, although Paul actually says that the other apostles had wives. And he cites Thecla, who is a young woman who broke off her engagement to follow Paul, according to the legend, each of whom, according to his mindset, are virgins and therefore of very high moral character. And that's the reason why he is citing them to prove her high moral character and to rebut the idea that she that she violated her virginity. That's the reason that he cites them. And he explains that right before the part you mentioned when he says that these she she has high moral character. So, yeah, that's the reason. OK, gentlemen, that concludes another round of fast paced cross exam. Excellent job to the both of you, keeping it engaging. Okay, we're moving into our next opening statement. This will be another opening statement from the affirmative side. William, yes, William, right. that'll be you. You got 10 minutes whenever you're All ready. Right. Great, let me just double check. Um, I've got my 10 minute opening and then, um, excuse me, Dan will cross examine me and then and then Dan has his, his and then, no, and then who has an opening after that? Is, is there another Good question? Opening? Yeah. Good okay. Question. So Dan, got, Dan yeah. I'm sorry. Okay. Gotcha. Okay. Then Dan, and then, uh, and then I get to cross examine, uh, Dan or Turretin fan. No, then you, um, okay. I got you, Dan, Dan, I got you. I got you. Yeah. Just guide me, guide me. If I mess anything up, just, it's, just it's a very me. interactive fast paced format. So no, no worries. worries at all. This helps me as well. Okay. So, awesome. I Actually, William, before you do start, I, I just wanted to confirm with the um, negative side. Turretin fan, is, is it you or Dan that'll be cross-examining William right when he's done his opening? It will be me since Dan did the okay. other okay. cross-examination. Yeah. Okay, I've, I've got that on the on, on Putting the, the heavy here oh. right on me, eh? <laughs> William, my good man, whenever you're ready, floor is yours. Let me get my timer, minutes. and uh, you're able to start yours as well. Let me begin mine now. I am going to take uh, an approach where I'm going to go look at Revelation 12 as well, but I'm also going to heavily rely on the church fathers. So I'm expecting Dan or church and fan or anybody to grill me on the early church as well as Revelation 12 would be like. But I'm relying heavily on the fathers as my brother in arms, Sam, opened it up and dealt heavily with the Bible. And time is very limited. Let me begin by noting that indeed, as the audience knows, I am Catholic. And in 1950, the great blessed Pius XII noted in Munificentissimus Deus that it is indeed true that at the end of Holy Mary's earthly life, she was assumed body and soul into the glory of heaven. Before noting this ancient and apostolic truth, Pope Pius noted how this had already been built into the liturgical life of the church. Indeed, we find common ground with all of our apostolic brothers and sisters when talking about Holy Mary's assumption into heaven. The official statement of the OCA, the Orthodox Church of America, and even pan-Orthodox synods of theirs, tells us that the Feast of the Assumption of the Theotokos is preceded by a fast and then goes on to talking about how this is part of the faith. It is built into the faith. That's an official statement you can find on their webpage. Of the Assumption, Syriac Orthodox scholar doesn't get better than the masterful Dr. Brock says, it is built into our liturgy. It is an essential of our faith. One would not be able to deny this teaching. This is built into the very life of our faith, Oriental Orthodoxy. I see you. Of the assumption, Syriac Titan 
Dr. Harak notes, we agree with Rome's statements on St. Mary on her bodily assumption into heaven. This is ancient and was believed in practice well before the schism. Of the bodily assumption, the Assyrian Church of the East officially notes of America, we celebrate the Dormition and the assumption of the most blessed Virgin Mary. Now the brother Sam masterfully went over Revelation 12. Of course, our time is limited. I'm not going to go over all of the elements he went over, but I want to touch upon certain elements to emphasize the bodily nature of what we're seeing here. Now we have a great sign appearing in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of 12 stars. Then being with child, she cried out in labor and in pain to give birth. Then we have the great imagery of the fiery red dragon. And then, of course, hearkening to Psalm 2, verse 5, this woman bore a male child who was to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. We got into conversation where uh, we were asked, well, what is the earliest, what are early fathers that interpret uh, Revelation 12 uh, in a mariological sense? Now, and then we were accused that, well, you know, uh, you quoted uh, Quad Vult Deus, but he didn't believe in the assumption. Well, goodness, you asked us to quote fathers that interpreted Revelation 12 in a Mariological manner. If you want to talk about early church fathers that talk about the bodily assumption of Mary, we're here for that as well. Very clearly, there is a woman bodily present in heaven. Here we have the biblical basis that we've presented to you. Sam has set out to present the masterful biblical basis for Holy Mary being bodily assumed into heaven, her bodily assumption. But of course, let's go deeper into it because I promised you uh, a boatload of early church fathers. And indeed, I like looking at the masterful, the great Ephraim the Syrian. If you look at his, uh, you look at his uh, nativity, he's either hymns or sermons. I, I don't know if it's hymns or sermons. Uh, he, he masterfully talks about Holy Mary in, 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 a, in a string of writings where he talks about Mary, who is about to enter into his paradise. And, and then, of course, leads you to where uh, he then begins talking about Mary being bodily taken into heaven. Now, of course, we went over this text with the great Dr. Brock. So we have Ephraim the Syrian writing very early on in the 300s, clearly showing you there that Holy Mary has been taken to heaven. Let me also emphasize, tied up with this today, and who knows, maybe one day we'll, uh, we'll do a whole debate on that topic alone. Tied up within the writings of the great, great Ephraim is the queenship of Holy Mary as well. Now, we talked about uh, earlier, we were asked, to mention early writings, and um, I'm, I'm going to go through a bunch of them because Sam went through a few already. Let me go over the great Gregory of Tours, where here's another thing that I want to emphasize. Early in the church, as, as uh, the Reverend Dr. Daly will tell you, built into the liturgical life, and, and Father Daly will tell you, this is second century. We have evidence that this was already built into the liturgy by the second century, he's going to tell you. And then, of course, later on, you have early fathers postulating, okay, what could have happened at the end of Mary's life? Figures like the Gregory of Tours tell you, the apostles took up her body in a bier, I think it's like a platform, and placed it in the tomb, and they guarded it, expecting the Lord to come. And behold, again, the Lord stood by them, and the holy body having been received, he commanded it to be taken in a cloud into paradise, where now rejoined to the soul, Mary rejoices with the Lord's chosen ones. Theotechnos of Livia is not a household name when it comes to the patristics because his uh, manuscripts of his writings were dis discovered recently. Uh, but we've been working on a lot of Theotechnos, thanks to uh, Father Coppice, who has provided some fresh translations on his work. In his homily and the Assumption, he tells us, it was fitting that the most holy body of Mary, God-bearing receptacle of God, divinized, incorruptible, illuminated by divine grace and full glory, should be entrusted to the earth for a little while and raised up to heaven in glory with her soul pleasing to God. The idea that, well, you know what, this, this really just pops up later through fanciful tales and what have you. Well, you're going to have a tough time convincing the church in Nisibis because there were early council as well. There's an early council which talks about the holy bodily assumption of Mary into heaven as well. So we don't only have early fathers. And if this is a novelty, you would have figured that when this church gathered, when this church gathered with plenty of bishops that are present, and of course we recognize local synods are not on the same level as an ecumenical one, but it shows you that early on, very early on, without anybody uh, uh, protesting, you've got an early example of an early church gathering 
with numerous bishops at an early council proclaiming Holy Mary being bodily assumed into heaven. We're talking about the great St. John Damascene, who tells you it was fitting that she, who had kept her virginity intact in childbirth, should keep her own body free from all corruption, even after death. Now, one thing that I do want to uh, uh, spend time on uh, that was dealt with, and I think it's very important, and I, and I hope it does come up later, uh, is, is, and it came up in the cross-examination with Sam and a uh, Turretin fan, uh, is the Panarian 79. Uh, Panarian 79, we, we clearly, we approach this very differently. And, and I want to uh, emphasize that I think the text is very clear here. Now, it, what is Epiphanius, or Epiphanius, however you want to pronounce it, Saint Epiphanius, what is he doing here? Number one, if you look at the tra trajectory of the Panarian, He's condemning the Coloridians, very important to point that out, condemning those that are worshiping Mary. He says, look, we venerate Mary. We don't worship Mary. La trevo, la trias, for God and God alone. We don't worship her. But then he says, look, well, you know, he begins talking about mortal people well before he gets into discussion about Mary. People that die, people that eventually die or go to heaven. And then he says, look, she's mortal. She's not a God. She's not a divine figure. We don't worship her. It's bound into the teaching of his refutation of the Coloridians. But he does tell you, like the bodies of the saints about Mary, she's been held in honor for her character and, in an, in, and her understanding. And, excuse me, if I should say anything more in her praise, she is like Elijah. How is she like Elijah? Who was virgin from his mother's womb, always remained so, was taken up and has not seen death. And then here comes the, the part where people say, well, I don't know of any apocryphal tales or any tales in the Bible that would draw a parallel with John and Mary. She's like John who leaned on the Lord's breast, the disciple who Jesus loved. And right away, they throw it all out because, well, we don't have any tales of, of that happening. You know, we don't have any tales of, uh, of, of Mary leaning on the Lord's breast, but we do know that our Lord leaned on her breast. We know that he fed from her breast. And by the way, the multiple scholars, I can list them scholar after scholar after scholar that have examined this text that are Dormition scholars, <laughs> Dormition scholars that have looked at the text in the Greek tell you this very clearly is referring to Mary being assumed into heaven. So yes, you clearly have this in St. Epiphanius. I've got about 30 seconds left. In my final 30 seconds, uh, I want to emphasize that, yes, we can see this very early on, and we look at what scholarship, those that are experts in the field, what they have to say, specifically those that are looking at the new, new fragments that are being found, and they say this was built into the life of the early church. There's a very clear reason why every apostolic church to this day believes and held to the assumption, and goodness, we even have some of the early reformers on our side because some of the early reformers believed in the assumption as well. So they'd be agreeing with us today. William. Time is up. Perfect timing. Appreciate the 10 minutes. Second opening statement from the affirmative side, William and Sam. We're now moving into our next round of cross exam. This time, a Turretin fan from the negative side, you'll be leading the way. And so gentlemen, the floor is yours for 10 minutes. Turretin, just make sure to unmute. You're good to go. It's just setting my timer. Thanks very much. I, sure. I appreciate this opportunity, William, to speak with you. I wanted to begin with your comment about the, you, you offered a quotation from, I think it was Dr. Brock, that uh, this that there was something built into the liturgy as early as the second century. No, 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 Father Daly. Sorry, Father Daly. Okay, so, sure. uh, and if I recall correctly, when that question was posed to him, it seemed to be posed about veneration of Mary generally, not about the bodily assumption itself. Is that correct? No, you are incorrect. In fact, in the show that we did together, and let me emphasize again, the show that is not aired yet is airing tomorrow on my channel, another show I recorded with him a month ago. I asked him that very same question again. When it comes to Holy Mary, when it comes to this, why is it that there's a certain explosion later and there's never really any 
uh, pushback, he replied and repeated yet again, this was built into the liturgical life of the church. And I want to emphasize and, and, and be very clear because I don't want to uh, misquote uh, Father Daly because this, as far as I know, is not present in his Dormition book, but it will be present in a new book coming out that he has coming out. But he did say this multiple times on my show and he said it in the context of what about where is the origin of this if you can give a certain estimation. And he said it was built into the liturgical life of the church. I'm curious why he would write a, or why he would have published a book of early homilies on the Dharmitian that's about four centuries later than that. If the, in fact, the, this, the Dharmitian as a liturgical element was part of the second century. I can answer that for you. Yeah, that's why I'm asking. Okay, I didn't know. I, I thought you were making a general statement. No, I can answer that for you. So very clearly, if you look at what Father Daly's goal was, it was to go and assert in, into a certain subset of literature in the patristic era and to deal with a massive gap. As you know, a lot of the texts that we have come just from him. There's only two people that have translated Del Technus into English, him and Father Coppice. His goal was to go at a certain period of time and bring those Dormition homilies to the forefront. Notice how Father Daly also believes that Epiphanius believed in the bodily assumption, but he doesn't include Epiphanius there in his book. So he's dealing with a certain level of fathers. And if I'm correct, I don't think he even translates pseudo John. I could be incorrect about that. I have to open that up. I don't think he even he, he translates that one. So he's dealing with a lot of older texts. Uh, and in particular, those that can't be found in English. I think he wanted to fill that particular gap. But as you know, church and fan, I am not misrepresenting him. The full show can be found in my channel if people think of any kind of misrepresentation. And they can watch the show airing tomorrow, which, by the way, the brother Sam has already seen. Uh, so moving on to the question of bodily imagery in heaven. Yeah. Uh, what did you mean by that? What's the bodily imagery? So, so I was quoting the consensus, by the way, uh, that being Dr. Katus, uh, Dr. Brock, the Reverend Dr. Coppis, and I was quoting Father Daly with a very same uh, question by myself was postulated to them. That being, when we look at this figure in heaven, this vision of this woman, what are particular clues that can clue you into her being bodily present. Now, multiple elements there point towards it being a physical presence. One of them emphasized by Dr. Brock being the crown on her head. Now, of course, as you know very well, the reason Dr. Brock has an interest in this is because multiple, multiple Syriac fathers use crown and robe imagery, yet there is no literal commentary we, we can see verse by verse commenting in Revelation or Revelation at all or Revelation 12. But a particular interest is there noting that that crown is emphasizing the physical nature of the female there. So that's why I made that comment about the scholars, what they have to say about the physical presence there. So focusing on the crown imagery, I'm sure you're aware that the 24 elders also have crowns. Are you suggesting that the 24 elders are also bodily present in heaven? What passage is that? Uh, Revelation, two places in Revelation mention the, the 24 elders having crowns. Uh, I can give you the... I, I don't know if you're referring to Revelation 5. I don't know where you're referring to. I think it's fine. So the first place is in 4. The 24 elders fell down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that live forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne. Uh, before that, at verse 4, it said that they had on their heads crowns of gold and... Uh, and then yeah, those 24 I, I, elders are mentioned again in chapter 11. Yeah, I, I would have to examine those texts. I have not looked at them. It would be irresponsible to, to attempt to give you an answer. But uh, very clearly, I think you're referring to passages. I'm looking, uh, I'm looking at my reading here just briefly to answer you. They clearly have spiritual bodies. Angels have spiritual bodies. Uh, so to answer that very clearly, that would be a clear point there. But uh, Holy Mary doesn't have a spiritual body. She has a physical body because she gives birth to a physical child. So... I would rather go with the reading that we find in the early church fathers. I think that's very clear that the earliest, as we know, the earliest extant commentary, complete commentary in Greek on the book of Revelation, not only identifies Holy Mary as the woman of Revelation 12, but identifies her as being bodily assumed in the heaven as well. Well, you raise an interesting point. So uh, Ecumenius commentary, the Greek Ecumenius, commentary, yeah. what, 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 
what's the point of citing somebody that we don't even know who he is and he's not a church father? What's the point? Well, yeah. you have a number of scholars that argue that he was locally venerated. It could be it would be like arguing that certain figures, even though they don't have the name saint tied to them, aren't important. He's considered massively important because he wrote a massive commentary on the book of Revelation. So I think he's pretty important. Now, I don't know why you are now I saw my cross examination, but let me very let me answer by saying it is a little bit perplexing to me that you have an issue with somebody that isn't considered sainted or uh, an early church father, in your opinion, when I don't think you put that much emphasis on how we view early fathers as saints or as doctors or not. He's a very important figure because he was locally venerated and he does write a very important detailed commentary of Mary as the queen of heaven, bodily present there, and also as the mother of the church. So very first extant Greek commentary in a Mariological sense. And I would also argue the oldest, the oldest extant connection that we have in early church history of the figure of Revelation 12 and who the woman is would be a Christian interpretation, would be a Mariological one. So the oldest one interprets her as the virgin, a Mariological one. I know we have others like Victorinus and Methodius and interpreted as the church, but the earliest one would be a Mariological one. And then later, once we realize that, and I don't want to go with speaking too long, the canonicity issue is, is pretty much taken care of. Uh, the commentaries explode and we have way more identifying Mary as a woman of Revelation 12. So in fact, though, isn't it the case that in among Greek commentaries, immediately after Ecumenus commentary, Andrew's commentary comes out, Andrew of Caesarea, and he rebuts what was just said by Ecumenius and says he's sure. wrong, not just that he has another opinion and it can be both, but that it's wrong to say that the woman of Revelation 12 is Mary. Well, what Andrew of Caesarea does is he notes that there were people before him that interpreted this in a Mariological sense. I believe Andrew of Caesarea interprets it as being the church, but that's perfectly fine. You're asking me why I point to Oikumenius as being an important figure. I think he's important because his commentary is massively detailed. Do we have others that prefer the interpretation of the church? Yeah, we do. But notice what scholars say as well. As we note what Dr. Brock says about Andrew of Caesarea is that plenty of fathers, including probably him and Methodius, avoided interpreting it as strictly Mariological because certain fathers didn't like the imagery of the birth pain. So they would avoid that because they were unable to say, hey, how could Mary, we know who was all holy, how could she have had birth pain? So they avoided that and they interpreted it as a, an ecclesiastical interpretation. Ecumenius also struggled with that, right? He, he also didn't think she suffered birth pangs and he had to spiritualize that and say it's because she was embarrassed that she's pregnant or something like that. I, I, uh, I don't know about that. I thought that he, I'm going to push back there. You, you may be right, but I could have, I could be almost certain that part of his interpretation, and, and I don't have the time to look at it right now. I have a snippet though, but I could be certain that like other fathers, he looked at the birth pangs as being related to the passion. Now it could be a different father that I'm referring to. I'm almost certain it was him though. Uh, but if it was not him and it was another father, I would strongly agree the birth pangs there are very clearly its imagery hearkening to the passion of our Lord, not literal birth pangs that the mother is undergoing. So in the West... And, and Turton, before you uh, ask your question, uh, another cross-exam is basically flown by. So you have time for one more question, then we'll move on. Okay. Hmm. I, guess, I feel like I have to choose my question very carefully. For that. The, the last, you, you, hold that on, last let me just tell you right away, I'll get that, before you ask that one question, I don't want to suck up all your time. So if you are going to ask me uh, about Mary and Revelation 12, I would not like to rip up your time. I'll open up my, my quote box of the commentaries in Revelation. Now I have it ready, so ask me whatever you'd like. Okay, so the question is... Uh, why should we think this is something other than cherry picking the one Greek writer that agrees with the one Greek commentator that agrees with the conclusion that you're arguing for when all virtually the entire Western commentary tradition, the church the, of the church that you're a part, all, even the ones who affirm the bodily assumption like Gerho of, uh, 
Reichensberg, I think one of the medieval commentators. There's others as well, Nicholas of Lyra, I, and sure. uh, we could, could go on. I could go, literally could go on and on and on, all these fathers, including those, like I said, who do actually accept the bodily assumption. They all call it the church. And why, why cherry pick this one Greek guy who's immediately rebutted by another Greek? So let me be very clear, very, very clear. I, number one, I don't agree with you that he was rebutted uh, by another Greek. I think that that's reading into it because Andrew Caesarea says, some, on the other hand, have understood this woman entirely to be the Theotokos before her divine birth giving was made known to her. So I don't agree that he rebuts all of the others. And secondly, uh, to be very clear, uh, I don't want the audience to come back and say, oh, man, look, you're referring to fathers and, you know, interpreted Revelation 12, but it didn't interpret the assumption. It's a different category. What you're asking me is early commentaries that connected Mary as the woman of Revelation 12. It's a different question if you ask me for early fathers that dealt specifically with the assumption. Some did both, but I don't agree again with your selectiveness. And I don't agree when people say the massive majority all interpreted this as being the church. No, I already mentioned to you, the earliest second century source doesn't do that. St. Epiphanius allows that to be an option as well. Well, we have quad vuldeos, we have oikumenias, but we have more after oikumenias as well. So I don't agree that we have Cassiodorus, we have some early liturgical documents, we have Idolfonsus of Toledo, Ambrosius Alpertus, we have multiple. And I, I, to answer that, I know that's your final question, but I want to leave people with this cliffhanger because I will cross-examine this later. The earliest extant Reformation era commentaries in Revelation 12 provided the Mariological reading of Revelation 12 as well. So I'd say tonight, me and Sam are on great ground. Gentlemen, another uh, great and professional round of cross-examination. And so truly an excellent debate so far tonight. I appreciate how comprehensive it is and also appreciate just how much knowledge all of you have on this topic. Uh, combined, we got a high IQ here on the panel tonight. So seriously, great debate, great work uh, from all of you. Okay, we're moving into now the final opening statement for for tonight. And so that'll be you, Dan. Let, Donnie, let me, let me just interrupt really quick. Uh, yeah. After, okay, uh, after after Dan goes, do I cross examine him or, or, or Church and Fan? How, 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 what are we doing? Good question. And, and you're right. Yeah, you'll be cross-examining Dan. So basically, okay. Dan will give his opening for 10 minutes, and then you'll have 10 minutes, William, okay. to uh, cross-examine Dan. Do I do I get to cross-examine Church and Fan at all, or, or I don't have that here? Um, let's see here on the sheet. I'm, uh, I'm happy to share. <laughs> because uh, that's up to you, Donnie. Your turn. You know, I, I, I don't actually see a, a, that's okay. a that's section. Okay. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll get them next time. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so I guess I guess that'll be up to uh, you know the, the okay. negative side the Protestants. Well, I'll, I'll take them both. Okay, <laughs> two on one or one on yeah two on one. Okay, well gentlemen, again, thanks for the professional debate, and we're moving into Dan Chapa's ten minute opening statement. So Dan, I do see slides though at the bottom of the screen. Are you looking to share those? Yes, please. If you could add those, I'd appreciate it. Yeah, yeah, I just want to make one comment, guys. I was never, ever told or given the option to use slides. So, you know, that, that is a little bit of a, I didn't say anything earlier, but had I been given that option, we would have utilized slides. I was never once told that we could utilize slides and never once notified that slides would be used either. Absolutely. Anytime, gentlemen, you, you're all free to use slides, screen share, so on and so forth. So, um, okay. Well, I guess with that, Dan Chapa. Please let me know when you're ready and you have 10 minutes for your opening. Uh, thank you, Donnie. And uh, of course, thank you to William and, and Sam. Uh, appreciate it. So um, I'll start out with the, the main claim, I guess, that uh, is caught my attention is that it's built into the faith and also um, the Roman Catholic anathematization of those who deny the assumption of Mary in the papal declaration. Now, if this doesn't apply to you, Sam, based on the way you answered your, your question, maybe it doesn't. Um, maybe from your side, it's uh, let's take it or leave it. But if, it, if, if it's more directed to William, that's cool. But uh, my first argument is that the assumption is unnecessary for salvation. Christ is the full revelation of God. He's the ultimate that we're going to get in terms of who 
who God is. And in Christ is hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And then Christ revealed everything that's necessary for salvation to the apostles. So when Paul preached, you know, the full counsel of God, he did not preach about the assumption of Mary. That's just not part of the full counsel of God. It was not what was revealed to him from Christ. Christ says that he heard from the Father and then he turned around and taught his those the Father's words to the apostles. And that was not part of the message that Christ taught to the apostles. He, Christ didn't teach the apostles about the assum bodily assumption of Mary into heaven. Then the next step in the argument is the apostles uh, perfectly announced Christ in his gospel to the churches. So they, they taught the full uh, counsel of God. The book of the gospel of John was written so that we can have eternal life. The, uh, the uh, epistle of 1 John is written so that uh, we may have fellowship with the Father and the Son and that his joy might be full and that we may know that we have eternal life. And yet there's no word in the Gospel of John or in 1 John about the bodily assumption of Mary into heaven. So this was not part of the gospel that they taught. Now, um, and they, they came back and affixed uh, uh Paul specifically affixed an anathema if you teach a different gospel other than that one that he preached, as well as the one that the church has received in Galatians 1, 8 through 9. And then in Galatians 3, uh, 15, he says we're not to add anything to God's covenant. Um, and and we, he also says in uh, Corinthians um, that, uh, let's see, it's in I apologize. It's in uh, first first Corinthians um, that are three two uh, second Corinthians three six. I apologize that the apostles were made sufficient ministers of the new covenant. And if the apostles didn't know about or teach the bodily assumption of Mary, how can they be sufficient ministers of that covenant? So once we demonstrate that this doctrine, the assumption of Mary, or any doctrine, fill in the blank. But if we teach that the assumption of Mary isn't in scripture. At the same time, uh, we're proving that it's not necessary to believe that doctrine in order to be saved. And my concern is that with this language of that it's built into the faith and the anathematizing of the rejection of it, that that's adding to the gospel. Okay, so now we go back to Revelation 12. So just to give a summary of the text. So the text speaks of a pregnant woman. She's clothed with the sun, she has the moon under her feet and stars as crowns. She's attacked by a dragon, gives birth to a male king who's caught up to God. The woman flees into the wilderness for 1,260 uh, days. Michael and the angels fight, and they beat the dragon, who is the Satan, and throw him and the demons down to the earth. Um, martyrs are said to um, have conquered Satan by Christ's blood. Satan is now on the earth. He pursues the woman. She flies on wings to the wilderness and escapes for a time. Satan issues water out of his mouth like a giant flood, uh, but the earth swallows up the water. And then Satan is furious with her and makes war with her and the rest of her offspring, while uh, which are those who believe in Christ and in God. So how would we even construct an argument that this text teaches the bodily assumption of Mary? So we have premise one, which uh, Turton, Fan, and I agree with. The Revelation 12 speaks of a woman. Then we have a conclusion. Therefore, Revelation 12 teaches the bodily assumption of Mary into heaven. Well, how do we get from premise one, that Revelation 12 speaks of a woman, to conclusion that uh, th this is the bodily assumption of Mary into heaven? So what you need is some hidden premises, that the woman is Mary, that the woman is Mary, but not just Mary. It's after her death, but before the end times resurrection. Then you need another premise that the woman is in heaven, not on earth. And then you need another premise that this woman who is in heaven is bodily in heaven, not just her soul. So you need four hidden premises that, frankly, we see are being eisegeted into the, the text. And not just eisegeted into the text, they're contrary to the text in some ways. But it's not on us to prove that these are uh, false premises. Where is the evidence that these premises are true? So the woman is, they're saying that the woman is Mary rather than the church, even though she has other kids besides Jesus and that these kids are believers, but they don't believe that Mary had other biological children. So th that seems like an issue. And then also the woman is given birth 
and she's flying through the wilderness, which happened on earth, not in heaven. And that happened during Mary's life, not after the end of her life. And then the, um, the, the giving of the birth happens on, in Bethlehem, not in heaven. And Satan's chasing of the woman is on earth, not in heaven. And in fact, it specifically says it's after Satan is cast out of heaven that he's chasing her. So this these events are happening on earth, not in heaven. So what we have is a change of persons from Eve to Mary to Israel to the church. And whenever it's convenient, we just switch them out. To, to dodge inconsistent details that don't match the text and change of locations from earth to heaven. And we can't, uh, anyways, this, I, I just simply don't agree with that argument um, that Revelation 12 teaches the bodily assumption of Mary. It's being read into the text. Okay, um, for next, let's go on to um, the sources of this tradition. So let me bring in slide eight. Okay, as Protestants, we like to ask, where is it written? Well, the first, the oldest source we have is uh, the 5th century book of Mary's Repose. Now, the, the, this text says specifically, as Jesus, Jesus speaks and he says, I am the third that was created. I am not the son. That's from paragraph 25. He, Jesus goes on to say, uh, or no, Mary goes on to say, I bless the cherub, the great cherub of light who dwelt in my womb. So, Mary is calling Jesus the great cherub of light in the book of Mary's repose. And then um, it also says, and the apostle saw as Mary's spirit, I was given into Michael's hands, a perfect form, but its body was both male and female. So Mary's body is both male and female, according to the earliest text that we have on the book of Mary's repose. What about the next oldest text? Well, we have the fifth century um, book, uh, the six books on Mary's dormition. And in that text, we specifically have offerings given to Mary three times a year, and, when, uh, and offerings are given to Mary. And then we have uh, John the theologian, who uh, William favorably cited, but John the theologian says, I bless the great cherub of light who dwelt for a time in my womb, calling Jesus an angel. So uh, these are heretical sources, the three oldest texts that we have that give a detailed breakdown. Of the bodily assumption of Mary are heretical documents. Now, we also have John of Damascus, who's um, in the 700s, and he draws everything from his, his writings, from these three sources, and he also contains excessive praise for Mary. So when I say he's, John of Damascus contains excessive praise for Mary, he asks Mary to save us from her sins. He says that by celebrating Mary's praises, we pay off our debts. He says, who would be wrong to call Mary heaven unless he indeed he truly said that she is greater than heaven in surpassing dignity. He says uh, she who nursed her creator as an infant at her breast has the right to divine tabernacles. Mary had the right to be assumed into heaven, had the right to go to heaven. Mary, the mother God, had the right to the possession of her son. Uh, and as a handmaiden, the mother of God, to the worship of all creation, so she has the right not only to, to possess Jesus, but to the worship of all creation. And then uh, well, he goes on, but uh, you get the point. So there's excessive praise for Mary. But also the details of John of Damascus' text is from these three heretical sources. So you see the details of Mary was laid on a bed. The virgins, there were three virgins that cared for Mary. Mary was di died and was buried. Mary was washed with water. Mary was wrapped in a special garment. The apostles flew to Mary's graveside uh, on, or her bed on clouds, like Thomas was in India and he flew over on a cloud um, to, be with, uh, to be with Mary. The apostles took Mary's body to the tomb on a bier, which is, uh, is like a funeral plat platform. Um, then there was a parade following her body. The parade happened outside of Jerusalem at the Mount of Olives at Gethsemane. Jesus was there. And the second parade. scan. The, there's Old Testament figures. The point being is every detail that John cites is from these six heretical sources, and there's no detail that John's providing otherwise. The same is true of Jacob of Sarag. The same is true of all the sources that uh, were provided except for Epiphanius, which we'll cover later. Okay, that's time. Uh, Dan, 
that concludes your uh, 10 minute opening statement. So we're now moving into what looks to be the final cross exam as well for tonight. And this time it'll be William. You'll be leading the way in cross exam with Dan Chapa. So gentlemen, whenever you're ready, <clears throat> again, you've got 10 minutes. Go ahead. Great. Dan, in the video you did on your channel with Turton fan, I don't know if you all said it in the opening as well, but in the video, I noted very clearly that you say that Jacob of Saru has the death of Mary, but doesn't have the assumption of Mary. Do you still hold to that? That is the text in the appendix E of Shoemaker's text. Yes, that he, he provides Jacob of Saru's poem, and there is no assumption, just the death. Her soul goes to heaven, but not her body. So, so whatever Shoemaker is provided, that's perfectly fine. Uh, I am referring to Jacob's multiple texts on the Assumption, in particular, his reading and his poem at the Council of Nisibis. In fact, there's only been one person that has translated these. That's Dr. Brock. Uh, how can you say that Jacob of Saruk, and the reason I'm bringing him up is he's a very important Dormition and Assumption father. How can you say that he didn't teach the Assumption if he clearly is talking about her being taken, her body being taken to heaven? And he even says, the church on high and that below cried out with one hymn, for neither those above nor those below could suffice to tell of her. The ranks of the exalted assembly cried out from this one to that one to shout their praises. And then he later talks about a beautiful crown being put on her head in heaven. How could you tell us that Jacob of Sarum doesn't have a bodily assumption if he clearly presents this to a council in Nisibis in the fifth century? Okay, so the way Shoemaker describes it, maybe uh, he maybe he's wrong, or maybe it needs updated. What? At four eight four eighty nine, Jacob of Sarug preaches his eighty first festal homily, and in that it does describe Mary's soul going to heaven. It talks about she's she dies and she's buried. There's an assembly of apostles. There's the light that's shown. She's surrounded by her family. Let, let me the, just pause. The just pause cry let me pause you for one second there. Uh, you are aware that Shoemaker provides no translation of the Assumption text of Jacob of Saru. You are correct. You are, you are aware of that, right? Well, he provides it in his appendix e in English. So that's what I'm going off of. If you have more information, I'd, I'm, I'd love to hear it. I'd love yeah, to learn. Shoemaker doesn't but, provide any, any translation of the, of the Assumption of Mary into heaven. There's only one that's translated that. You can find it, and I'll, I'll tell you right now, you can find it online and the Mother of God from, from Brock. Nobody has translated the bad but Brock, where Jacob of Saru clearly talks about Mary being taken into heaven. Furthermore, I'd also uh, point you to an interview that I did with Dr. Brock, uh, let, let me just finish, a few weeks ago, where Dr. Brock affirms yet again on that show that, yes, Jacob very is known prominently for having taught the bodily assumption of Mary. So I'm just very curious why, if you're going to bring up a figure who's so prominent that actually was presenting this teaching at a council, but you're going to claim he never taught the bodily assumption. I I've got to say, Dan, I I'm a little bit perplexed by that. Well, I could be missing that piece of information. My understanding of Shoemaker is he's saying sure. that the 81st Festal Homily was preached at the 489 Council of Nisibus. Did now, you read that? You, it, did you read that? Yes. And I read the 81st Festal Homily and it does. It Where did you find that? Soul, Where did you in, find that homily? In, in Shoemaker's 2002. Yeah. Shoemaker does not quote the Council of Nisibus anywhere, my friend. There's only one person that's translated that. It's not Shoemaker. I can tell you that definitively right now. There's one person. That's Dr. Brock, not Shoemaker. He provides a, a commentary from Jacob. He does not provide any translation of Nisibus. That's from a fragment. Only Dr. Only Dr. Brock has done that in English. So you didn't find uh, any of the sword in Shoemaker. You, you may have me on that point. Well, Without a doubt, I do. Now, you mentioned another particular father. You brought up Germanus. And the reason I'm bringing these particular fathers up, my friend, is because these are very prominent Dormition and Assumption fathers. And the claims being made, in my opinion, are quite strong. In a bit, we'll go to the dating of the stuff that you brought up. But Germanus of Constantinople, you brought him up. And in, in I'll even tell you where you brought it up in your video. I don't know if it was you or Turton fan, but I assume you all are on the same page. I'm going to assume you all are, are one person right now. Uh, in your video on St. John Damascene, 
you claim that Germanus does not teach the assumption. You say he teaches, like Jacob, her death, but there's no assumption. Uh, is it not true, my friend, that Germanus of Constantinople is one of the most prominent assumption fathers that there is? I'm looking at his homily, too, where he very clearly teaches that Mary was taken bodily into heaven. So, no, I mean, let's see. I'm somewhat reliant on Juniper Carroll's work where he says that. Juniper Carroll but, says that Germanus only taught her death. That's not possible. I've got his book right here in my phone. I can read it to you where he says Germanus is one of the great Assumption Fathers. Let, let me let me move on to another question. You, because my time is fleeting. I've got about four. I have about four yeah. minutes and 20 seconds left. Yeah. You brought up, um, and I think this is important. So you brought up, and there's impossible in a debate to go over all of the dating of all the documents, unless we just did that for an hour or two hours. But in your videos, I, I think you all did it in the opening statement too, and in your videos, you, you brought up how Shoemaker talks about the origin of this being within heterodoxy, within Gnostic uh, communities. Uh, and you, you quote that, I don't remember if it was your truth invent, you quote that from Shoemaker's book. Am I correct about that? That is Shoemaker's theory that it's not of a Jewish Christian origin, but rather of a Gnostic origin. And you the, quoted um, Book of Mary's did, Repose. Where did you quote that from? I don't, I don't want the quote because my time is running out. But where did you quote that from? What book did you quote that from? The, with the his, Shoemaker's 2002 work. I think it's chapter four. Are you aware that Shoemaker has just released a brand new book a few months ago, 2023, where he walks back those statements? And he says, I know that I said this once. But scholarship has essentially moved away from this. He no longer believes that this originated within heterodoxy. Have you all read that new book that has come out? Well, so I, I, I'm aware of the book. Um, but you haven't read so, it. No, I have not read it. The, the, so I'm just, the, let me the just, six books, the six books, uh, um, the, which is the second source, and it's the first of the Bethlehem narratives, seems to me to be Coloridian in origin, so, which would not be Gnostic. I agree with you on that point. So even if it would be Coloridian, that would be heterodox. So let me, by the way, uh, I, I don't agree that that's the second one in dating. Uh, I think that if you look at uh, Danny Lou, you look at Katoops and many others, they put that one earlier than the Book of Mary's Repose. But you mentioned the six books Apocryphon. Is it not true that Shoemaker in his brand new book on this topic says of the six books Apocryphon, and I can quote it for you, but let me summarize what he says. He says the six books Apocryphon is remarkably orthodox in its theology. No, no, no. no. no oh, I'm not correct. Absolute really? heresy. It's absolute okay, hold on. heresy. Hold Even on. if he says it, he's, no, I'm asking he's you if he going says to that, account though. to God for that. Hold on, my friend. You're quoting him as a source. I'm not asking your opinion. I am asking you if it is okay. not true that he's walked that statement back. Well, okay. So is that true? Yes or no? As you walk that statement back, it it talks about making offerings to Mary. My friend, I've asked you a simple question. Did he okay. not okay. say that it is orthodox? I don't, I don't know, but I but even if he does, you can't make offerings to Mary. She's not God. She didn't die on the cross for our sins. Was so he? so the the offerings, by the way, Shoemaker doesn't believe that those offerings are idolatrous. He believe he he also says he realizes of course he doesn't. Uh, let, let, let me just say he also real what do you mean of course he doesn't? He's not Catholic. He's not Catholic at all, my friend. Uh and he has stood against many other Dormition scholars. So uh, let me go to the clear point. I want to also point okay. out one thing for the audience. And and, and it's, it's a friendly kind of gesture towards you two. Over and over, you're pro providing uh, quotes and statements from his older, very old book, about 20 years old. I'd recommend you get the, the new one and realize he's updated the Syriac, the words of Master Mary and what have you. He's cleaned up the Syriac. Those are not present there. So I would invite you to look at the latest scholarship in this and Shoemaker. You'll find that not only does he say that this is not heterodox, but he has corrected a lot of the Syriac errors there. I'm just wondering, if you're aware of that book, why would you not have read it and realized that a lot of the statements you're making today have been walked back by him? The, so offerings to Mary are contrary to scripture. That's the we, issue tonight. We, we can Please. very much debate what those offerings are at another time. I'm asking you why you would quote old shoemaker information as a source of him saying this is heterodox if he tells you today this is 
remarkably orthodox. And he says, this is a new Syriac translation. And a lot of the words that you use, Master Marian, what have you, have been cleaned up as they are not proper translations of the Syriac. I wonder why you all would not be privy to these new translations if you're quoting Shoemaker's old book. Yeah, I mean, that that's a fair point. I'm I'm all for reading his latest material. That's okay. That's that's cool. What's not I, cool I, is making offerings to Mary because we I, worship God alone. And I don't believe that they're not worshiping Mary. Mary. Mary didn't die on the cross for my sins. And they don't teach that in the six books apocryphon. Now, again, I don't believe the six books apocryphon is the earliest testimony, but they don't teach that in the six books apocryphon. What we have in the six books apocryphon is dual veneration to Mary, not latrual. I'm not talking about the book of Mary's repose. I'm talking about the six books apocryphon. But Donnie, I wanted to ask you a question. I don't know if these gentlemen are on board with it. You can give them some extra time if you want as well. But Sam wanted to ask Dan something. If you would allow that, Donnie, uh, you all can also ask us an extra question. Would that be permissible, Donnie? Yes. I, I, well, for me, it's fine. I guess it'd be up to- Would that to, be okay uh, with you, Dan? Would you guys like to add another five minutes each maybe to cross- There we go. Out? Let's do that. L let me give, um, I'll give Sam five minutes to, to talk to Dan. And whoever wants to talk to me, just don't let it be turret in fact. Whoever wants to talk to me, <laughs> can talk to me. You know, I want to avoid him today. Come on, guys. We've been going at it for almost 20 years, okay. man. Bring him don't in. throw him, him at me. You guys go way, you guys go way back. Okay, so let's do that. An extra five minutes each for cross exam. What we'll do is have uh, so I've got Sam back in here. So William, if you don't mind, I'll put you backstage and then we'll uh cool. Okay. Yeah, uh he brought up some points uh, for Revelation 12. Go so by the grace of Jesus Christ, if you time us. Okay. Now, Revelation 12, I thought I had addressed it, how it could be a heavenly scene, even though these events take place on earth. But let's put that aside. I want to know what your interpretation is. Who's that woman in heaven? I think it's a church. Okay. So are you saying the church is in heaven and gave birth to Jesus? So the church is both militant and triumphant. So... I can't hear you because uh, so the church gave birth to Jesus in heaven. No, I'm not saying the church gave birth to Jesus. But you said it's the church, so who gave birth to Jesus? Well, Mary gave birth to church to Jesus. The question is whether the child oh, no. is what, Jesus. Okay, let's even go. If it's the church, then the children are the church. So the church has given birth to the church. <laughs> The, the church gives, uh, I guess it would be, I guess those would be believers. You're talking about verse 17 where. No, no, I'm talking you know, about, me, you just said, let me, let me repeat. You said in Revelation 12, four to five, that's not Jesus. Okay, let's go with that. Even it is, but you guys, for some reason, they're not the obvious. But let's go with so, that. The church is giving birth to the male child. Who's the male child? Yeah, I mean, that's that, that's a good question. I'm not. So Dan, honestly, as a brother, I, I say you have and I say this, you haven't thought about the implication of your position? I mean, I'm not saying this, but I'm saying, honestly, you never thought about, wait, if it's the church and you're telling the child is the church, so the church is giving birth to the church. No, not, uh, I'm sorry, I didn't I didn't say that. But you, you have me on that I'm not very dogmatic on what this text means. Because but I want to know, though, because if I tell you it's Eve, it's it? church and says it's not, who is it then? So I can address, because I still don't know what you believe about it. Who is it? I said, Eve, pictures Israel. Your friend said, no. Can you tell us for the audience who the woman is? Because we still don't know what your view is. So the woman is the church. The question is, who is her son? And I'm, not, not, I'm, not, I'm not sure. I, I'm not talking about that. You did it could say be some future true. event. It could be just oh, some oh, future oh, event. Okay, well, slowly, then, because I'm trying to figure. I'm not trying to steamroll it, but I'm trying to <clears throat> When John is written, are you saying... That woman hadn't given birth to the child yet? Yeah, it could be a future event. Yeah, for sure. Future In fact, event. it probably is. It probably is okay, talking so about the future. How does that coincide with the Christ giving a power power to reign? So Christ is not reigning yet because it goes with Revelation 12. So when does Christ reign? Is he not reigning already? Okay, so it does talk about Christ's reign, I think, in both 10 and then again in 17. Right or no, yeah. no, verse ten, yeah, verse ten, right. So yeah, so yeah, well, sure. Christ, Christ is reigning from his throne in heaven. Now, in the future, you know, in the millennium, of course, he'll he'll rule here on here. But doesn't 12, 12 tens on the say in the millennium? It says now, 
when these events happen, Satan has been barred and Christ is reigning. So was Christ reigning and did he triumph over Satan after his death, resurrection and ascension? From his throne in heaven, Christ is reigning okay. now. Yes. So now, then it's not that's the difference when he returns to earth yeah. in the millennial kingdom, he'll he'll reign. So I'm a dispensationalist. Yeah. So before I you go to because I rule out of Jerusalem. Yeah, but before I, I I'm not trying because my time is up. I, I get your point. But if you read Revelation 12, Christ is reigning while the dragon then pursues her children. He's already reigning before he returns to the earth. Because if we go with your millennial explanation, Christ comes down and then he bars the dragon into the abyss. But if you read it chronologically, Christ is already reigning when the dragon is hurled and he pursues the children of the woman. That can't be referring to Christ reigning on earth during the millennial reign. It must mean he's reigning now. So that's true. When, yeah. Agre you agree, right? Millennial starts after the trip. This is in the tribulation. So this Christ. Physical reign out of Jerusalem would be not in Revelation the, twelve the ten. Millennium. Not Revelation twelve ten. You're talking about Revelation. So focus with me, because if yeah. you follow chronology, because that's why I'm saying my time is being eaten. Jesus is already reigning when Satan is then hurled to the earth, and barred from heaven and pursues the children of the woman. So this means he's already reigning before he comes to the earth to start his millennial reign. So that means. It must be referring to an event that's already taken place, not future, right? Well, he's he's reigning today. He'll reign a thousand years from now. He, well, when John wrote it, was he already reigning? Yes, he was. Okay, so then how do you say it's future? You just admit John wrote something that's already passed. Be, be, because Christ reigned in the past, and he's reigning now, and he will reign tomorrow in the yeah. next day. Any Second those, question. Revelation 12, 17. It last says, questions now. Yes, I'm going to make one. Revelation 12, 17 said that he pursues the children of the woman and they hold to the testimony of Christ. Who are those children that hold to the testimony of Christ? I think they're believers in Christ. And who? So are believers part of the church? Yes. So the church is going to give birth to the church. So the church is the children of the church. And you don't see a problem with your interpretation? The church. Uh, the church is going to get, uh, I see. Yeah. Okay. My yeah. Time is up. Okay. Fair enough. Thank you. That's Dan, it. did you want to finish answering the question? Or you got you, you gentlemen good for, because uh, it I looks think, like. Uh, church so, wants to so, now barbecue the, William. So the, I'm back yeah, the, 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 the bottom line is prophecy is difficult. There's no question about it. And I won't know that until I see it. Once the the historical once it becomes history and then then I can come back and explain it to you step by step by step. Until then, I mean I believe it. I'll do the best I can to interpret it, but it's going to be tough. Okay, gentlemen, we've got our next uh, five minutes of bonus cross exam. So we understand that the audience loves cross exam. I like to oh, say you can no. never have too much cross exam, and so I'm going to put Dan Chapa backstage. Sam backstage, appreciate it. And now we're gonna have, if I'm not mistaken, the classic. There we go. The um, the, the boys who go back 13 to 15 years oh, ago doing debates. So right here, yeah. we're gonna settle the uh, you know 10 plus year ongoing battle. So if I understand correctly, though, Turton, you're okay if if William has the five minutes to ask you questions. No, no, he's gonna ask sure. me. Uh, I mean, it's up to you, but I, I'm happy to give you my five minutes. I know you had some questions for me or, or something uh, like that. Wow. Okay. Let me uh, let me pull them up. Give you one. You I mean, you don't have yeah, to. Yeah. I have okay, some yeah, questions. Yeah. If you want. yeah. Yeah. I'll 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 ask you. I'll, you you know what? It'll be this will be valuable for the audience. How about we use this final cross examination uh, cross examination piece to talk about Ephraim? Can we do that? Would you be okay with that? Sounds great. Okay. And I'll begin my timer. I don't want to go too far ahead. I know it's gotten a little bit late, and I know if I go too much later, and we have still have a little bit of time, my daughter will bust through that door and clock me right in the jaw. So let's begin right now. You want to uh, avoid Turretin, that, William? <laughs> yeah, I want to avoid that. Just talk. It's pretty tough, man. All right, Turretin, uh my friend, you in your video, you did multiple videos on Ephraim, and you you, you objected to uh, a particular reading of mine on Ephraim, and I think in the beginning you alluded to it as well. So. Uh, you alluded in the beginning, and you said that Ephraim never talks about Mary. 
uh, being assumed or taken into heaven. You do hold that position. Is that correct? Yes, okay. I, I do. What do you do with, uh, because I'm very well aware that there's a, a chain, like a katana, if you will, uh, of Ephraim, where he talks about Mary. I'm about to enter into his living paradise in the place in which Eve succumbed. I shall glorify him. But then that goes beyond that. It goes beyond, it's a, I don't know if it's a, a few paragraphs after, where we read that to a great height he lifted me with my saints to glorify him in the vast heavens. How do you interpret that if figures like Dr. Brock and I believe Kathleen Turner, I believe, she's a translator of that text online. Uh, I might be incorrect. Or it could be Catherine Katu, uh I, I forget. Let's stick with Dr. Brock. Uh, what do we do with the fact that Dr. Brock has classically interpreted this to be uh, a vision of Mary being taken into heaven by her son? And But you say that there is no bodily assumption in Ephraim. There is no assumption in Ephraim. C certainly no bodily assumption. You know, oh, e bo yeah. Either, both. I mean, we, you want to talk about assumption or bodily, but I lowered it to assumption because if we're going to talk about bodily, uh, I'd go to another text. But this one, but which by the way, I've got three open. Uh, but this one here, uh, how can this one not be Mary being taken into heaven if we clearly read to a great height, he lifted me with my saints that I might glorify him in the broad and vast heavens. What, what is going on there if, if Mary is not being literally taken into heaven? I'm not saying the way Ephraim uses paradise, but particularly here heaven. Uh, how can this not be Mary being taken to heaven? Great question. Uh, I would say, first of all, as you know, both Dan and I, believe that Mary was a believer and therefore her soul now is in heaven. So sure. we, we certainly don't deny that Mary's soul has been assumed into heaven. That That's okay. not our contention. So when we read any of, of the fathers or other Christian writers or even heretics saying that Mary's soul is in heaven, we just agree with them because it's the truth. Okay. So but, you, you believe that, let me, let me, let me interrupt really quick. So you believe that we can extrapolate from Ephron uh, a, a, soul assumption of Mary, but not a bodily? Is that your contention? I want to be very clear for the audience, because in your video, what I gathered from you and from Dan, and I think in the opening, is that there is no Mary in heaven in, in, in Ephraim. If you very clearly have Mary in heaven here, are you then contending that uh, there is a soul assumption? What, what is your contention then? Um, sure. So I'm, I guess I'll, I'll the, the, the work that you're quoting from which is hymn two of hymns on the nativity. I uh, the the first part of that is around line. I don't know. It's uh, it's broken into what look like stanzas, and that's from stanza sure. seven. Says yeah, most the, weird, of all, the weird way Ephraim wrote. He wrote in a weird way, like poetic. Well, it's a hymn, and it's being converted sure. into English. And the they I think they put more of an emphasis on uh, correct translation and less on trying to make it poetic, but. He says, most of all those healed, I rejoice, for I conceived him. Most of all those magnified by him, he has magnified me, for I gave birth to him. I am about to enter into his living paradise, and in the place in which Eve succumbed, I shall glorify him. That was like, a, that stanza seven. That's the one I think I spent more time on how that paradise that he's talking about there is Eden, because that's where Eve succumbed. Which I would and, agree with that, but I, I'm not referring to that one. I'm referring to the one that occurs, if I'm correct, three or four stanzas later, or I, I don't remember, but it's right. It's, it's yep. in that very chain of context. You're, you're uh, quite right. Yep. Okay. About what is it? Two or just three coming to that. Yeah, just coming to that. So, so, so how can the, the one where he's talking about Mary be taken into heaven, how can that not be an assumption of Mary? To me, it's very clearly an assumption of Mary. So in stanza nine, which is, uh, as you said, two stanzas later, he says, by go. the mouth of my glorious ones, I give thanks that I received the child, the son of the hidden one, as he emerged into revelation, to a great height, he lifted me with my saints so that I might glorify him in the broad and vast heaven full of his glory, but unable to contain within itself the greatness of the one who bent down and became small in the manger. I, I would offer two possible reasonable explanations of this. I think one reasonable explanation is this is talking about how she felt high and lifted up. The other explanation is that indeed it's talking about her being in heaven, but it, to the extent that it's talking about her being in heaven, it's not she, specifying she, that she's she there. That she sees bodily. the saints down below, though. No, she how, says how, she's with her saints, actually. But then she also says, if you go forward, that she sees the saints down below. 
I don't. Do you remember the? You happen to remember where that is? It's it's in the whole like it's long chain. You read the whole thing there. Uh, she's very clearly referring to being in heaven, not not earthly. Uh, let, let, let me ask you this. Okay. Uh, would you then? This is a very clear answer. You are even if you may disagree with him. Hey, it's not Catholic. Uh, even if you may disagree with Dr. Brock, you do realize Dr. Brock is the preeminent scholar in Ephraim in the world. You would you would recognize that. Last All question, right. William. So, oh, give me one more after that one. <laughs> one more. Okay, okay, you get one more bonus okay. question, William. Yeah, that after one. that one, yeah, just give me one more after that one. I I don't know the actual rank. Like, if there's an official ranking of who's the greatest scholar or anything like that, I well, have always I, I have that. always enjoyed hearing what he has to say, including on your that? program. So, go ahead. Awesome, awesome. Yeah. I'd love to have you on with him one of these days. I'd love that. It'd be a great privilege. Uh, the reason I ask you that is he interprets it as as Mary being taken into heaven. So that's pretty significant that the greatest living Syriac scholar on Ephraim interprets it that way. But maybe that one is debatable. What do we do with his, uh, this is the final question. I got to respect Donnie or Donnie's already flexing the chest there. He's going to knock me out, man. <laughs> uh, the final one, and there's so many more, but let me deal with this one. Where also Dr. Brock has, has confirmed this one here, where we read, what do we do with majestic and heavenly made lady queen Protect and keep me under your wing, lest Satan, the sower of destruction, glory over me, lest the wicked foe be victorious against me. That's his oration on the mother of the Lord. This very clearly to me, it's very difficult to argue against it, where he is saying she's a majestic, heavenly made lady, queen. It's just not very clear that Ephraim is teaching that Mary is queen of heaven right here. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I don't have any doubt that he says nice things about Mary and that he exalts okay. her far even to using phrases like queen of heaven, I don't remember that specific okay. place you're, you're mentioning, but it, it wouldn't surprise me. He has a very high and view. That of was a tough to find quote. And it was tough to verify because Dr. Brock was very busy. Uh, it's a very, it was a tough one to verify, but I can provide that one to you afterwards. The reason I wanted the final cross-examination to be an Ephraim, because I believe Ephraim is a very important figure when it comes to the assumption. My time is up though. And Turton fan, uh, thank you so much for allowing me to cross-examine you. Hey, it wouldn't be a debate with us and the classic if we didn't get to communicate with one another. <laughs> it's always a pleasure. Thank you. That I agree with. I feel like it would have been incomplete if we didn't get this <laughs> extra bonus round of, of cross-exam. So great job to the both of you. I appreciate how interactive this, this format has been. And so just great debate all around. Gentlemen, we still have our comprehensive round of rebuttals, though. We've got 15 minute rebuttals from both sides. Okay. And it looks like the first 15 uh, minute rebuttal will be from the negative side. Donnie, so, can we do this? Sam. Just, yeah. uh, William, if you want, we'll split it if you want. Uh, sure. Uh, I just want, let me see. He wants, do you want to go first? Seven so hold on. Uh, uh, we've got a rebuttal. That's just us talking. There's a 15 minute one and then a five minute closing. I'm all for you taking the 15 minute rebuttal. You want to give me, I'll do the five minute closing one. Yeah, well, if, uh, if you want to talk about some of the fathers, then we can do that as well. But okay, then we'll begin. No, we, and then you let me know. Yeah, I'll give you the fee. Give the, we'll communicate. I'll text you. Yeah. Go ahead. Oh. So I may not think. Of, we'll see. But who's going first 15 minutes? That would be good important. question. Yep. Yeah, so it looks like, okay, so Turretin, are you and uh, Dan splitting it up or are you taking most of the time? I, right now, I'm planning to take the time. Uh, I don't okay. think we'll, if we have to tag him in, uh, we can t always do, we can do that. But I think I'll just try to to do the time it's and then he'll take the match, conclusion right? yeah. yeah anytime you got to tag him in let me know but i will uh put you uh full screen and, and we'll can give you, you the uh, actually rebuttal. share my screen the sure yeah thank you so sorry for the small size of the image here uh, but i wanted to start the rebuttal by just pointing out that this is the book that dan was talking about the uh book by shoemaker this is the uh, where he in the text where he refers to the Dormition homily by Jacob of Sarug, which is identified itself as a work delivered before a church council in Nisibis in 49. A translation can be found, as he says here at Appendix F, and another English translation has been recently published by Hansbury, which I assume is the probably the translation. If, if there's a third translation, that would be a third one, but I think Hansbury's is the second and Shoemaker's is the first. I don't know if he's the personal translator, maybe he had somebody else do it, but it's here in Appendix F and you can see the relevant sections that are usually discussed uh, in here. So I, I won't belabor that point. I just wanted to quickly share that bit. I would, let's see, 
The next thing to share, I suppose, is some comments concerning Coptic fragments. I know this briefly came up during the discussion that there's some fragments of earlier works. And there had been some reports that some of these fragments were not that the fragments themselves were from the first or second century, but that the text that they represented was from there. But further study, and this is, an, uh, this is just a paper describing that further study, has concluded that in fact, this Vienna fragment, uh, which was published previously, the, and had some discussion of Mary, and people thought maybe it's part of the apocalypse of Mary, but that this, uh, it turns out, is in fact not from the earlier time as had been hoped. It had been hoped that because, of course, it would be wonderful to find some very early examples of literature, even if it's not necessarily by uh, Orthodox Christians. Now, turning to some of the other points raised. First, the idea that there's multiple layers in Revelation 12. I can understand the attraction of that idea, and certainly one can see some parallels between a woman giving birth to a child and this child having the rod of iron. Of course, as Sam conceded, that's already applied to believers in Revelation earlier in the book. And the, question, the real question is, what's the exegetical warrant for a multi-layer interpretation of Revelation 12? Once you realize that, in fact, it's referring to the church, why assume that there's also a second layer about Mary there? And even assuming there are multiple layers, why not just assume that the in heaven is part of one layer versus another layer? Why isn't the in, in heaven about the church? And why, isn't, why is the in heaven only about the uh, Marian layer? There's not an exegetical reason for this. It's just that's it would be nice because otherwise the scriptures don't have anything to say. And the ecclesiastical interpretation of the text, which got a little bit of, I think, like, well, it's obviously not right, is the biggest chunk of the exegetical tradition on this. If you go through not necessarily every person who ever comments and refers to the text, but the people who comment on the whole text of Revelation, they don't go there for lots of reasons, including the fact that this is part of the third woe as part of the seventh trumpet, things that are going to come to pass in the future as of when John was writing Revelation. It's not talking about the past. And that's part of the reason that most of these commentators tend to steer away from treating this as Marian. Also, the fact that the birth pangs certainly dissuades a lot because of the pre-existing view of the perpetual virginity. Now, Turning to the question about other apostolic churches agreeing, well, first, if you have an, an argument, a sound argument from scripture or from tradition, you wouldn't have to say, well, the Antiochian and Assyrian and uh, Ethiopian and so forth churches, they all agree with us. You wouldn't need to say that if you could just show it from scripture. You wouldn't need to say that if you could show it from tradition. The reason that we need to go there is because you can't show it from those things. And there's lots of ways to prove why the whole groups of churches agree on this point. The reason, in, in short, for that is that it started in the East and spread to the West. In fact, it spread slowly to the West. It took centuries and centuries before it was adopted in the West. The feasts that were started in the East were started afterwards in the West. In some cases, the gap is like 50 years between the emperor appointing the feast of the Dormition in Constantinople, and then uh, 50 years later, Sergius uh, places it in Rome, and then it's another 100 years before that feast of the Dormition becomes a feast of the Assumption in Rome. Yes, there are early writers like Theotechnos of Livius, uh, uh, not a particularly significant father, in fact, I don't know if, if he's actually considered a father officially, but he's an, an old writer. But he, we're talking about the fifth or sixth centuries now. Even if you could press it back to the fourth, or as some of these scholars will try to say, they think that these traditions began in the second century. But guess what? Even the second century is not the first century. What about the idea that the woman in Revelation 12 is crowned and clothed, and therefore there's, she's there in the body? Well, as I mentioned, in Revelation the 24 elders, which are also part of this same vision. If you go into Revelation uh, 11, which it's a continuous text from 11, 11 to 12, you'll see that the 24 elders are mentioned there before the, the, before the throne. In fact, here it's the ark, not the throne, 
but it's the it, the ark refers to the throne. And upon the seats, he said, this is Revelation 4, 4, and upon the seats I saw four and 20 elders sitting clothed in white raiment, and they had their on their heads crowns of gold. So unless you're going to say that these 24 elders are also bodily assumed in heaven, but that doesn't make any sense. What about the seven angels that are described in Revelation 15, 6? They, they have, they're clothed in pure and white linen and have their breasts girded with golden girdles. Well, what sense does that make? Why do spirits need to have golden girdles? Well, the answer is this is a vision. And the fact that they're wearing clothes in heaven doesn't mean that they have a physical body. What about the uh, Ephraim the Syrian as a testimony to the bodily assumption? Certainly the idea that her spirit is in heaven is something that no one should dispute. The only people who would dispute that would be people who think that she's body and soul in Eden rather than in heaven, but that's not one of the positions that part of this debate. As for Gregory of Tours, we acknowledge that he reported the fables that he heard, but even he qualified those fables as potentially inauthentic, and therefore that slowed their adoption as scholars acknowledge. What about lit liturgy? I, I strongly disagree with the idea that this, lit this somehow was built into the liturgy in the second century. I would love to hear Daly's argument for that and not just his assertion in the name of a, an important scholar. I think that he misspoke when he said that, but I could be wrong that he misspoke. Maybe he really sincerely believes it, but I'd just love to see the evidence. What we see broadly agreed by scholarship is that these feasts of the Dormition arose after Ephesus, not before, not certainly not in the second century. Now, in what way is it built into the liturgy? Revelation, even the book of Revelation wasn't used in the, e uh, in the East very often in the liturgy, if at all. In the West, it, had, it was it struggled to gain acceptance there as well. So the idea that this was built, that in any sense, Mary's bodily assumption was somehow built into the liturgy in the second century, I again, I would love to see the actual evidence to support that. What about the idea that Epiphanius claims she was bodily assumed because he compares her to Elijah based on Panarion 79? Well, some people have said that after further research from Panarion 78, that which, which includes a quotation of a letter that was written like 10 years before. So the idea is, well, that letter was written and then there's 10 years passed and then he's actually composing this book. And then, then in 79, he reflects some further study, some further development. But the problem is, first of all, he could have just edited that letter when he's composing Panarion 78 and 79, but there's other indications in his Panarion that he also doesn't think that she's one of the, either a person who's died and resurrected or a person who has been translated. And she, he seems to be aware of the teachings of the Coloridians. And we see evidence that the, and I think Shoemaker agrees that this work is a Coloridian work, but maybe he has walked it back. And if he has walked it back, again, I'd like to see why, because the text does talk about these bread offerings that are given to Mary. In fact, the text seems to be promoting female priests as part of the ritual, if I recall correctly. In any event, the, the fact is that in the Panarion, it's the preceding section, 78, that says he doesn't know the end of Mary. And then in 79, he makes a comparison between her and Elijah. Now, if this was anybody else or any other topic, we would just let the clear statement, no one knows the end of Mary, stand. And that's actually what Epiphanius believed. And in fact, scholarship for many years has said that that's what they think Epiphanius's view is, including Mariologists that are uh, approved by the church, that, that have, a, you know, that are like Juniper Carroll's Mariology has a Nihil Obstat and Imprimatur from uh, I don't remember which bishop, but it, it has church approval to it. And he's quite willing to acknowledge that Epiphanius claims he didn't know the end of Mary. And it's just remarkable that only 10 years before, he wouldn't know this if it had been built into the liturgy of the church since the second century. It's just uh, bizarre. But uh, coming to the, the third point, as I said, in this section where it's alleged that he's somehow saying that Mary ascended into heaven because Elijah did, and she's he's one of three people, just remember that the three people are 
Elijah, John, and Thecla, all of whom had different ends. John, according to the tradition, prayed, jumped down into his own grave, and the next day he came back, the grave was full of dirt. And then uh, sparkling dirt came out on anniversaries of his death after that. And Thecla is this famous martyr who, oddly enough, keeps avoiding martyrdom in the traditions that are out there, but she's identified as a martyr. So where does that leave us? That leaves us with the uh, going back to what the default position for us in this debate should be. Our default position in this debate should be the general rule. The general rule is that everyone dies. The general rule is that all of the believers will be will rise at Christ's coming. Neither the bodily assumption violates both or, or at least one of those rules. Either it violates the rule about everybody dying or it violates the rule about uh, everybody who is in Christ rising on the last day. But of course there are Elijah and Enoch as examples to the contrary, but those don't negate the general rule. They just show that there can be exceptions. The question is, why would we think that Mary is an exception? You can't just assert that it is and that John of Damascus says so. Well, of course, John of Damascus says so. But is he right? Almost all, I mean, virtually everything he says on this subject, we can trace back to fables. We can trace back to these six books, to the transitus literature. And again, we have a choir of carols, uh, E. Carol, J. Carol, O'Carroll, Michael O'Carroll, all of them telling us that the these traditions trace back to the transitus literature. And what do we do with that? Well, we could just ignore it, pretend that they got their tradition from somewhere else, from some hidden source that no one can identify. But that's not the case. The early homilies on the Dormition are from the 5th and 6th centuries. Maybe you could find something in the 4th, but... So what? It doesn't go back to the apostles. It's not an apostolic tradition. And then when we actually do examine the tradition, we find statements that are totally contrary to the assumption, such as Ambrose saying that only Jesus has risen permanently, or Caesarius of Arles saying that only at Christ's coming will any of his followers ascend to the clouds. Those are positions by people who don't hold to the bodily assumption of Mary, or at least they'd make a, a concession or exception for her and say, these are the general rules, but actually Mary's an exception or something like that. But the silence is deafening. And the silence, again, is agreed to broadly, that broadly there's silence among all the fathers before Epiphanius. And then Epiphanius finally speaks in the, in the East. He finally speaks. And what does he say? He says, I don't know. Why? Because there wasn't a previous tradition. It's not that we've just lost all those documents. It's that there isn't a Christian tradition on this. This came in from the works of heretics. It got cleaned up by people like the author of the of Pseudo Melito. But in, in short, this is a human tradition, a human fable. People like it because it seems to promote Mary, but that's not a good enough reason for us to believe it. And it's certainly not enough to make it a dogma of the church and insist that everyone has to believe it or to make it an official church holiday that we must celebrate. That's again, it's there's no warrant in scripture for doing that. Scripture is sufficient and more than sufficient to answer this question. And the answer is, even if we accept everything about Revelation 12 that they asserted, it doesn't show a bodily assumption of Mary, neither does anywhere else in Scripture. And on that, I'll uh, rest my rebuttal. Okay, Turretin fan, that concludes your 15-minute uh, rebuttal, the 15-minute rebuttal from the negative side. For tonight. So let me bring in the affirmative side. Yes. Uh, Sam Shamoon and William Albrecht. Gentlemen. Yes. Okay. Let Sam, me, yeah, were you going to say something? Let me, let me, what we're going to do, yeah. we're going to split up. He'll go first for yeah. about seven, eight minutes and hand it to me. So I'll be in the background. Yeah. So okay. I, right when I hit the seven minute mark, I'm going to pause. I'm going to hand it over to Sam. Seven right? minutes. And then we'll yeah. bring Sam back in. Yeah, and, for okay. Okay. Perfect. Here we go. I will begin now. All right. Let's begin. I've got very limited time. Uh, the dating of the six books of Apocrypha, number one, let me be very clear. Uh, the dating that these gentlemen have put forth uh, is incorrect. What they're doing is they're dating the age of, of the manuscripts. They are not in touch with Dormition Assumption Scholarship. The top Dormition scholars don't agree with them. I'm telling you right now to the audience, 
The top door mission scholars do not agree with them. I have personally spoken, and I'm pulling up a message right here. I'm going to read it to the audience. Dr. Katu is one of the top ones that has examined the manuscripts, and I'm going to read the exact text directly from her. I talked to her about the claim that this is 5th century in origin. Her answer was a very clear one. She's a top door mission scholar. William, and she told me I could quote her, virtually everyone today in the field of the assumption work, every scholar agrees that the Dormition narratives are much older than the MSS in the manuscript history. Just like the canonical gospels and Paul's letters are known to be much older than the oldest manuscripts containing them. In manuscript time, let me educate you, she tells me. Fifth century is very, very early among early Christian manuscripts. Virtually everyone in the field recognizes it's earlier. But today we have my friend Dan and Turretin Van saying, no, it originates then. Not a single scholar on your side today. No tone in the closing. I'm very being very clear. By the way, I, I recommend that my friends uh, look at shows that I've done with Sam on Angel of the Lord Theology, uh, Angel Christology. To be uh, uh, combating against that is to be out of touch with Christ as Angel of the Lord from Scripture. That is particularly why Shoemaker walked back a lot of the previous comments he had, he had made. Now, I want to address a lot of comments made earlier. I got about five minutes left. The bodily, yes, very clearly. There are multiple Greek words that give us indication this is bodily, including opte, which is used for actually vision, seeing things, seeing bodily individuals that is present there in Revelation 11 and in Revelation 12. Very clearly, this is of the bodily nature. We're being shown that the mother is present bodily in heaven. One thing that we didn't have time to get to, maybe in, in, in the closing, I'll mention a few, is that tonight there's a very clear precedent that's been laid out. The reformers at earliest, the very earliest, Francois Lambert being one, interpreted Revelation 12 in a mariological sense. And we even have the first reformers that believed in hell to the assumption. Now, I know the people that are going to come out there. I know the usual suspects. Well, hey, of course, you know, they were Catholic. Of course, they're going to hold to it. The early reformers held to scripture alone, very powerfully. If they believed something was against that, they would have denied it. Yet they held and believed in the assumption of Mary. Very interestingly, today, they would be on our side, the reformers, not on Dan or Turretin's fan side. That goes for Luther, that forerunner, Jan Hus, Wycliffe, and on and on and on I can go. The ancient churches all hold to this for a reason. We're told this starts in the east and goes to the west. Really? Uh, you got a big problem. Because what do you do with the post-Chalcedonian churches? The Orientals that had broken off already. You're telling me they're going to look to what Chalcedon had put forth? Really? Well, there's a council of Nisibis that tells me otherwise. They're not looking and trying to copy. Well, what are they doing over there? We're going to believe it. Now, it's built into the life of the church. It's ancient. We've shown it to you from the Bible today. Very clearly, one group of individuals were Bible-based in their presentation. Watch it over again. And you tell me who had the better rock-solid biblical evidence. No, Daly did not misspeak. We did another show. Help the views on my channel go up and tune into it tomorrow. Who He reaffirms that. Built into the life of the liturgy, second century. Now, I mentioned the Council of Nisibis, and I have no idea why church and fan tried to offer pushback. I told him it's very hard to find that. And they both told me Shoemaker has done it. No, he didn't. Get Shoemaker's book. I've got it open in front of me, an e-book. No, you didn't read that. Get the, get the actual book that I mentioned. You put up and you said, well, look at the appendix. It's not in the appendix, my friend. In the appendix, we're told there's a Latin translation and a translation that can be found in what work? I told you, on the mother of God. When I was cross-examining you, I told you where you could find it. Yet you went back to Shoemaker, who doesn't provide a translation, my friend. I emphasize that. And I want to be, with all due respect, you got to do your homework. If you're going to make the claims that particular pillars of the patristic era didn't believe in this, you're going to make the claim of Jacob, Ephraim, Germanus, and many others, but you're not going to actually do the deep dive into their work. Well, you're going to run into a problem when you encounter people that know what they're talking about. And I've read this particular, I've done shows on the Council of Nisibis and the bodily assumption in Jacob. By the way, look at my show with Dr. Brock. Shout out to you, Subdeacon Daniel, who asked Dr. Brock point blank, 
He told him, Dr. Brock, does Jacob teach a bodily assumption? He affirmed, yes, he does. And I got to thank you. I didn't think that would play a part in this debate, Subdeacon Daniel. Shout out to you, brother. Pan I got a minute 23 left. Shoemaker himself says that Panarian 79 teaches, Epiphanius is teaching the assumption. Shoemaker tells you, Daly tells you, Katoots tells you, these are the top Mariologists on the Dormition in the world. And they're all telling you, yeah, Panarian 79 is talking about the bodily assumption where Epiphanius, as he continues doing research, unlike the letter to Arabia, comes to a conclusion as to Mary's end. You've got the top scholars in the world telling you that? The top Dormition and Assumption scholars? But our friend Turretin fan and Dan, swipe that away. I'll tell you why they do that. They have to push it, keep pushing it and pushing it. Keep pushing it later into history. Well, today, our world has been the Bible and the early patristic history, and I dare say they have not been able to deal with it. By the way, as far as what's the connection with Tekla, look up and read the Acts of Paul and Tekla. Tekla was a young virgin from Iconium. It's very clear parallels that are made there by Epiphanius. And John, what's the parallel? There are two parallels there in Epiphanius. John's Dormition. We're literally told he had a Dormition. That parallel, come on. You're going to tell me you don't recognize the parallel of the laying on the breast and, and not recognize our Lord laid on the breast of his mother? My seven minutes are up. I'm going to give eight minutes to my brother, Sam. Okay, there we go. William, perfect timing. I'll pause the timer so Sam gets a full eight minutes. Sam. Oh, let You're me just unmute, unmute you. You're on mute, brother. Yeah, let me know when I'm winding on like a minute left or by the grace of okay. Jesus Christ. I appreciate okay. it, brother. Lord, you found Lord sure. May the Lord Jesus anoint us to speak clearly without error. I'm going to try my best to accurately represent what Turton said. If I get it wrong, it's not intentional. There's a lot to cover. What I found very perplexing is the claim that when it comes to the assumption, you cannot find early attestation prior to the fourth century. I say fourth century because Epiphanius, which he calls into question. But here's what's ironic. If you guys remember what I said in my opening statement, that revelation fought its way into the canon. There were early Christians that accepted it, but later on it was questioned, eventually became fixed. So we would not assume to find <clears throat> many commentaries of Revelation that would connect Revelation 12 with Mary being assumed. But for my Calvinist friend who believes in tulip, such as limited atonement or sola fide, as defined by Martin Luther, when he talks about the argument is deafening, unlike what we have for Mary based on Revelation 12, the scriptures are full of references on saving faith, on justification. And yet, if we apply his standard, he cannot quote to you a single writer, father, apologist, second century, third century, fourth century, not even <clears throat> Augustine that taught limited atonement. Nor can he show you from early church, second century, third century, fourth century, fifth century, up until Luther where any Christian taught sola fide as defined, I don't want him to tax straw man, by Martin Luther, not even Augustine. Nor can he find his view of hardcore predeterminism prior to 407 because the Augustine of pre-407 was in line with the church, a fact even admitted by Reformed scholars that man was endowed with free will. It was the post-407 Augustine in his debate with Pelagius that then adapted a more hardcore form of predeterminism that he inherited from the Manichaeans. So again, people living in glass houses should not be throwing, throwing stones. That's one point I want to make. Secondly, again, I'm going to give him Bennett Fowl for the sake of charity. He used the 24 elders who were crowned as somehow <clears throat> a valid refutation to what William said. Well, if Mary has a crown... And somehow that means she has a body. What about the 24 elders? Well, number one, I do believe, I don't know if he does, that spiritual creatures do have bodies. They're spiritual in nature. Nor did we argue simply that Mary in heaven was assumed because she's in heaven, because that was parallel to the other point about the 24 elders. Well, does that mean they're assumed? No, that wasn't our argument. So Turretin, I hope you represent our argument correctly. They have spiritual bodies. But the reason why we know the woman isn't simply a symbol of someone that's merely spiritual, but it entails an actual woman 
because she gives birth to the child, which for the life of me, I'm shocked. You kept denying it's the Messiah. Guys, don't take my word for it. Even read Protestant commentaries and <clears throat> reformers, not just church fathers. Get you a commentary by Protestants. They will tell you the male child is most definitely Jesus because he's fulfilling Psalm 2, though by extension it applied to the church because the church is one body with him. So on the basis that the child is physical, he has a physical body, we can assume that the woman has a physical body because of the fact she gives birth to a physical child, not simply a spiritual, ethereal entity. Moreover, even if we go with the view of Israel, well, according to Romans 9, verses 4 to 5, Christ is an Israelite according to the flesh. So we'd still have to affirm that if it's Israel, it is referring to someone with a physical corporate body because the child descends from that corporate physical entity physically, Romans 9, 4 to 5. So that was not our argument, Turton. We were not simply arguing she's in heaven. If you heard what I said is she's in heaven because like her and her child, she is destined with her child to go to heaven and rule. Because if you just take the plain reading of the text, Psalm 2 is messianic. I don't know why you guys have a problem with denying it. This is the first time I'm hearing. Again, maybe I'm not well read. A Protestant would deny that the child is Messiah and by extension the church. Which leads me to another point. I did not use Revelation 12, 4 to 5 to argue the church is a woman. Lest I misheard you, you misrepresented my position. I said that the fact that Jesus and the church both fulfill Psalm 2 proves the point I'm making. What's the point? You can have a symbol that's multi-layered. I didn't make it up. Guys, don't take my word for it. Get any good Protestant commentary. And not only that, look up Genesis 3, 14 to 16. Look it up. Tell me if that woman who's pursued by the dragon, who's a serpent, who gives birth to the main child in labor pains, is not a reference to Genesis 3, 14 to 16, which means that here we have Eve in view, but Eve becomes a picture of Israel. How do we know? Because then you find Revelation 12, 1 to 2, the dream of Joseph alluded to. Genesis 3, 7, 9 to 11, 12 stars, sun and the moon. So Eve becomes a picture of Israel, which is why even Israel is ascribed as a woman giving birth in labor pains. Jeremiah 4, 31, Isaiah 66, 7, 17, 24. But beyond that, as I demonstrated, the text also alludes to Isaiah 7, 10, and 14. And no one denies that that woman who's a virgin is Mary who gives birth to Jesus physically. Unless you have an axe to grind and unless you don't want Mary to be exalted because you can believe in the exaltation of Mary. You don't have to be Catholic. You don't have to be Orthodox. Just be biblical. I made my case on scripture. Yes, I did say that the father saw that this refers to Mary, and some even took that to her coronation. But I tried to keep my argument contextual, textual. And I demonstrated that if you let the text speak, there's no way of denying this refers to Mary, which again, don't take my word for it. If you go throughout the Old Testament, you'll find individuals and nations point to others. For example, Malachi chapter 1, verses 2 to 3, which is a proof text that Calvinists like to use for double predestination because they butcher how Paul employs it in Romans chapter 9. It says Jacob and Esau stand for two nations. That's in also in Genesis 25. If you read Genesis 25 and you read from 22 to 26, there you'll see that God himself says the twins stand for two nations. <clears throat> Galatians chapter 4, verses 21 to 26, Paul says Sarah and Hagar stand for two covenants, two people. Hagar stands for Israel under the Mosaic One covenant. minute. Okay, and Sarah stands for the descendants of Abraham through faith in Christ, the church whose mother is heavenly Jerusalem. It's all throughout scripture. In fact, Isaiah 49, 6, which is about the Messiah, is applied by Paul to himself and Barnabas, where it says that you will be the light of nations, bringing my salvation to the ends of the earth. In Acts 13, 47, Paul applies this text about the servant to himself, that we are the light, who bring God's salvation on the earth. In other words, the Bible confirms that a symbol can be multi-layered. So this symbol refers to Eve, woman, and the blessed mother. And by the way, the fact she's a queen in heaven, that means the Bible supports there is a queen of heaven because she's crowned and she's in heaven. It is a biblical teaching, not a pagan one. Time is up. Sam, thank you very much.
to everybody on the panel, very comprehensive rebuttals, a debate of this importance uh, needs to be comprehensive. So great work to everybody. And we're moving into closing statements. And so first closing statement, five minutes goes to the negative side. I'm under the impression, Dan, you're taking the closing statement. Okay. Well, here we go. Whenever you're ready, you have five minutes for a closing statement. The floor is yours. Thank you again to everybody that's participated. It's been a, a pleasure. So uh, let's start with Revelation 12. So I still see that there's four assumptions that have been made by uh, Sam's analysis that haven't been improved. The first is that the woman is Mary. It seems from uh, Sam's analysis, the woman is Mary when it's convenient. And when it's not convenient, then it's not Mary, then it's Israel or Eve or the church or whatever. But so when it comes to the woman has other kids, oh, that can't be Mary. When it comes to the kids are uh, believers in Christ, well, no. So, you know, it's just the, the person kind of changes when it needs to. Also, the location changes when it needs to. So the assumption here is that the woman is Mary after her death but before the end times general resurrection of all believers, because that's the window of time that Sam and uh, William need this to fit into. Because if it's during her life when she's actually giving birth to Jesus, then it does not uh, support the bodily assumption of Mary. If it's talking about the wilderness, her wilderness journey uh, to Egypt, that was during Mary's life, not after her death, when she supposedly was uh, bodily assumed into heaven or uh, th that sort of thing. So the time frame jumps around, the person jumps around, then we have the assumption that the woman is in heaven, then we have the assumption that the woman is bodily in heaven, not just in soul. And frankly, even if you grant all of Sam's points that he's made, you still just don't get to the bodily assumption of Mary. I just encourage everyone that's listening to this debate tonight, just go back and read Revelation chapter 12, and you won't find the bodily assumption of Mary into heaven there. It's just not there. Okay, other uh, points that were brought up in the debate. Um, when William said it's built into the faith, and he obviously is coming from the Roman Catholic side where it's anathematized to, to not, uh, if you deny that bodily assumption of Mary, it's simply not part of the full counsel of God that Paul preached. Paul didn't preach the bodily assumption of Mary. He preached the full counsel of God, not the bodily assumption of Mary. The, the apostle John wrote the book of John so that we would have eternal have life and wrote first John so that we could know we have eternal life. And neither in neither of those works is the bodily assumption of Mary because it's not built into our faith and we shouldn't be anathematizing people who don't hold to the bodily assumption of Mary. Um, other arguments that came up. So for the most part, the um, um, Turton fans opening arguments of the tradition against the assumption um, were not answered in the debate, and I understand that there's you know issues of time, but the arguments like the 400 years of silence that it's missing from all the history. So like, why isn't it in Eusebius or Jerome or you know all the different uh, Christian authors and, and church fathers that, that you know talk about the different people that were assumed into heaven, like Elijah and Enoch, and they talk even about Paul when he got up, went up into the heavens, and John, and even Habakkuk is listed as going to heaven and things like, well, they just don't mention Mary for those first 400 years. Why is that? And then we have the positive statements where it says, like Ambrose, who says um, that Christ alone is the only one that uh, was resurrected to not taste uh, death again. So we have the positive evidence. We have the, it's missing from the histories. And then we have the heretical sources. And this is probably, frankly, it's quite concerning because what I heard William saying is, well, yeah, they talk about offerings to Mary, but that yeah, let's 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 give them the benefit. Maybe that's not so bad. When in fact we have Epiphanius blasting the Coloridians for making offerings of bread to Mary. Well, those same offerings of bread are talked about in the six books, and in in William is waffling. He wants to baptize the six books as if it's if it's an uh, okay account, if the, if that's an, a fine thing to do. And let's just well let's let's get into the definition of offerings or something like that. No, 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 no. Epiphanius got it. That's why he, he 
uh, blew the uh, Coloridians out of the water. And then when it talks about uh, these, these texts up, talk about Jesus as the great cherubim of light, and he starts talking about, well, what about the angel of the Lord text? No, 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 no. Let's <laughs> let's not mess with these heresies when they're when they're saying these horrible things and denying Christ's divinity. And you know, let's not let's not go back and try to baptize them. In fact, what we actually see is the exact opposite. The church fathers who saw these texts went back and deleted that stuff. They copied them, but they took that stuff out. They're not saying, oh, well, no, those older sources are fine. Let's, you know, let's debate the definition of is. No, they crossed this stuff out when you see like Jacob of Throg and when you see the, uh, guys like, uh, um, um, well, I, I apologize. I forget some of the other names. Ten um, seconds. Oh, uh, G Gregory of Tours. They literally go back and take out the heresy. Same with uh, Pseudo Miletus. They're taking this heresy out. They're not just saying, oh, it's not that bad. Okay. Um, last thing. I would endorse uh, Donnie hosting a debate on limited atonement between Sam and Turton Fan. Thank you very much. There we go. Oh, yeah. yeah. I, I'm all for that. Sounds like a blast. Sounds could, like it could, can break some could, records. Could you, could, you, could you put them both up? Would they both accept that? Most definitely. I'll okay. set it up. Oh, Church whoops. And, we got to get turned in there, too. Would, would, you, would just, you do that? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring in John Calvin to help me. So let's do it. <laughs> set it up. Not kidding. So would would I, you do I, that, Turton fan? Yeah. I think oh. you're mute, my friend. You're well, muted. Turton, it, I, I, I can read his lips. I think he said yes. Okay. He's muted. He muted himself. In fact, Donnie, if you can. Reach out to Anthony Rogers to debate Mount Limited Atonement. Could you do that? Won't do it. There we so it looks like the challenge is out there. Limited atonement, Anthony yeah. Rogers, and also Turretin fan. Yeah. But Turretin fan looks like he's accepted. Now, if we're gonna oh, do a two on two though, Sam, you have John Calvin, you said. So Turretin, right. who are you? Oh. So Turretin, who are you gonna choose for the two verse two? I guess I'm gonna have to bring in Augustine. That's gonna have to no. be oh. oh please make my day. Oh no. This will break the internet. Gentlemen. Oh no 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 no! <laughs> All right, bringing me oh, now. Oh, you're going to bring me into this debate. Now you're going to have to find a partner to debate that. No 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 right. no. Okay, guys, um, this is great. We still got one final five minute closing from the go. affirmative side. William, are you taking the five minutes? Yes, yes I will. Uh, Sam, you want me to take the five minutes? Yeah, go ahead, brother. Go ahead. Okay, go. you got this. awesome. Let me uh, hold on, brother. Let me just pull up my. Thing and I will begin right now. Are you ready for me to begin? Yes, you're good to okay. go, William. Here we go, right here. Thank you very much for that. Uh, let me go quickly because time really does go very fast. Uh, first off, I want to correct a lot of misconceptions. Um, look, if anybody wants to see how we broke down Revelation 12, rewind it. You know, rewind it. That's the best thing I can tell you. There's very clear evidence in who that figure is. Um, there is one historical figure that gave birth to the child that will rule the nations with a rod of iron. You're going to tell me Psalm 2 is not messianic? No, the fathers are unanimous on that. It is messianic. And if you look historically, of course we talked about multiple layers of imagery. But historically, who gave birth? Think about it. Evangelical friends, please, for a moment, put aside your bias and think. Who gave birth to the Messiah? Well, the woman of Revelation 12 is the mother of that Messiah that will rule the nations with a rod of iron. And you're telling me it can't be Mary? I have got to say, that is why the early fathers interpreted Revelation 12. And I believe the earliest interpretation is a Mariological one. And many others interpreted it with multiple layers of imagery. Now, we recognize not all did, but plenty did. We quoted many of them very early as well. And we even have the reformers, the very earliest extant reformed commentary. As I mentioned earlier, I'm not presenting new evidence, Francois Lambert, many others. We have many others. We'll probably present it in a show because we did a lot of research. But the earliest interpretation of Revelation 12, even in the Protestant world, includes Mary in the imagery. But we're told today it can't be Mary. We're told that, well, William and Sam walked it back because Revelation 12 talked about the children of the, of the woman. You, know, you can't have your cake and eat it too. But we've really enjoyed our cake tonight. And yeah, that woman is Mary. She's the spiritual mother of them. Because if you read that text, who is the mother? The mother very clearly is Mary. And then we read about her offspring, those that keep the commandments of the Lord. Very clearly, there are those that are part of the church. 
She's the mother of the church. Don't believe me? The very author of Revelation 12 is the author of John 19, 25. Now there stood by the cross Jesus' his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, behold your mother. Very same author. Now we were asked, well, how do you know she's there bodily? We'll read it contextually. Of course she's there bodily in heaven. Sam broke it down great. But I'm adding to it by pointing out there's a crown. We're shown the imagery of the crown on a physical body, physical imagery all over the place. And where is she present? She's present in heaven. But we're told, where are you going to get the bodily assumption of Mary? And our main case today, remember, I went second because our main foundation was Bible today. And we proved it from the Bible alone. Then we supplemented it with the fathers. Who is the mother of the figure that gave birth to the Messiah? It can only be one primarily, historically. There's multiple layers there, but it has got to be Mary. The early fathers preached it. The reformers preached it. We're told for four, 400 years, people don't mention Mary. We brought up Epiphanius over and over. And no, scholars don't agree with you in Epiphanius. But we've got Epiphanius. I brought up Ephraim. Ephraim's a very, is in the 300s. Um, and then we're told about all of these lists. Uh, you know, those lists are, are, are hilarious. Uh, look at the, the list from Tertullian, who was talking about the fact that Enoch and Elijah have got to return so they can die, because everybody has to die, is his argument. Uh, these aren't good arguments. Arguments and silence don't prove anything. And they relied on Shoemaker for the claims of heresy. By the way, I didn't say that I, I, I didn't condemn the Coloridians. No. I said a great debate can be had on the identities of the figures. Because Epiphanius criticized women priests in the Panarium. They're not women in the books of Pachrophon that I brought up. They are not priestesses. We're told the angel of the Lord is a heresy. You got to give me a break. This is why we argue that the Mariology, the Marian dogmas are so essential to Christology. If you don't have a proper Mariology, you will not have a proper Christology. Because angel angelomorphic theophanies and theology christ as angel of the lord is ancient biblical was taught by the early fathers all over the place i'm glad we set the record straight on jacob and sarub and a lot of other things today and i know my time is up but i want to go over 10 seconds to say donnie you have been an incredible moderator give a tip of the hat to you i have had a great time here probably better than i've had in a lot of other places. When it comes to evangelical platforms, you are the cream of the crop. You've done a great job tonight, and I want to be back on your platform. You've been great, and I've appreciated the time with Turretin fan Dan and my brother Sam. Thank you. William, I really appreciate those kind words. It really has been a privilege to host all of you. Just four true professionals. This is an example of uh, how a debate can be when we get uh, experienced debaters into the debate octagon, as I like to call it, and engage a topic of this importance. So great job to all of you. And I look forward to having you all back on, uh, hopefully sooner than later. So, okay. Well, there we go. That concludes the concluding statements of tonight's debate. And Seriously, that was an epic debate. Uh, you guys did not disappoint. There's Thank been a lot of hype for this. So, by the way, Donnie, how long were you doing QA? Just curious. How about let's say between 25 and 30 minutes? I think is what we got on the yeah, um, that would be excellent sheet. because that will give me enough time. Because God willing, they'll give me an hour because afterwards I'm going to go to my channel, do a post debate. Q&A with anyone who wants to come. So that would give me enough time. So if we do half an hour, then I'll have an hour to do some errands and come back. Appreciate it. Perfect. I think that's great. So to the audience, we'll do 30 minutes of audience questions. We'll get through as many as we can. We'll start with the super chats, of course. And then uh, the guest links are in the description box. So if you want to go over to uh, Sam's channel for a post-debate Q&A, please do so. Okay, with that, we're just going to get right into the questions. Now, typically how we do it here, uh, gentlemen, whoever the question is for now, it is a two verse two tonight. Sure. And so I guess, let's say the question is for, uh, team Sam and William, you gentlemen get to respond first. 
Then we'll give uh, Deanne and Turretin an opportunity to respond. And then we throw it back to you guys for a final word. So essentially, whoever the question is for gets the final word. And again, to be fair to the audience, I'll just start at the beginning. We've got a ton of questions. We'll get through as many as we can in 30 minutes. And I'll start the timer now. Okay, here we go. So uh, let me see here. First question. Okay, first question comes in from Berean Perspective Apologetics. I know you all have a little bit of history. So here we go. Um, yeah. Okay, uh, $7 Super Chat. Appreciate the support. Question for Sam and William. And I will say to the audience, some questions have come in that I find are not professional enough or respectful enough to our guests tonight. All, that includes all four guests. Yeah. We're not going to um, we're not gonna ask those ones. We're going to make sure we're sticking to questions that are on topic and on point. Okay, so with that disclaimer, here we go. Yeah. So his question is, neither Jesus, apostles, apostolic church fathers taught the assumption of Mary. Why is the RCC uh, dogma, maybe? Dogma. Dogma, yeah, salvific, dogma, but not biblical. Gentlemen, go ahead. No, you have to explain the dogma part, then I can follow up. So what do you but, want to say about um, that? To be very clear about it, um, <clears throat> I think we made it. By, by the way, Donnie, do we have a limit? It's like a minute or two minutes? What is? Yeah, it? why don't we do uh, two minutes each? So okay. basically you and Sam get two minutes. Okay, let me, I don't want to go way over. So, okay. Um, to be very clear, uh, we, we made the very clear argument tonight that this is biblically based, very clearly taught by St. John. Uh, but another thing that we don't do that, that my friend uh, Kelly has uh, the, the bad habit of doing is pitting the Bible against itself. He did that very clearly. Go look at our debate on the perpetual virginity. He did that very clearly there where he'll say, well, look, I don't care if one Bible book does teach it. Well, where did Christ talk about it? We believe the whole Bible is the inerrant word of God. And if we find it only in one book, that is sufficient. Even if it's found in only one book, that would be sufficient. So be very clear about that. We made a very clear biblical case tonight. We built from that biblical case with the early church fathers. As far as the apostolic early church fathers, of course, they don't talk about it. There's a lot of things that they don't talk about. But to be clear about one other thing, um, Kelly, I don't think if the apostolic fathers taught this that you would believe it because the apostolic fathers taught a lot of things. The yes. Holy Eucharist truly is the body and blood of Christ. And I can bring up tons of things that you don't believe in. So I don't yes. think your standard are the apostolic fathers, just to be very clear about it. And then you say, why is the Roman, uh, Roman Catholic, Catholic. Roman salvific? Okay, I, I, I think I've already answered that. So I, I think that it is, it is a biblical and anything that is biblical uh, it's very important to follow. So hopefully I answer that. I went a minute and a half. I didn't go two minutes. Uh, Sam, do you want to piggyback on that? Yeah. So we have 30 seconds, right? Yeah. Okay. Well, real quickly, like you said, even if it was demonstrating scripture, he would still explain it away. For example, he mentioned apostolic fathers. Ignatius affirms a monarchical episcopate, yeah. that you had a mono <clears throat> episcopacy, where you had the bishop, presbyters, elders. Now, Ignatius is a disciple of the apostles appointed by them, and he was the bishop. And he died as a martyr. Now, will he now repent and accept that structure? Okay, so it comes from a father who knew the apostles who appointed him. No, he's going to explain it away. So this is nothing but smoke and mirrors. To not to deal with what the scripture does say and how the fathers interpreted the data. Okay, I appreciate it, gentlemen. Uh, team Dan and Turretin, floor is yours. Go ahead. Oh, Dan, I think you might be on mute if you are talking. Yeah, you're on mute, my friend. Oh, thanks. I'm going to yeah, mute myself thank you. now. Uh, appreciate it. Uh, okay, so the Revelation 12 text, it, it, for starters, I agree uh, with the, the premise behind the question. If it's not clearly taught in scriptures, then it's not necessary for salvation because the Christ revealed what we need to believe to be saved to the apostles, and they taught it, and they wrote it down in scripture. And that is the very purpose that's uh, given, especially in the Gospel of John and First John, for their writings. So um, to add to that is, is a highly problematic and as far as it being clearly uh, taught in revelation 12 again what we have is mary she shows up in bethlehem for the birth then she's back into heaven and then she shows up in the desert and then she's back up in heaven like so where is she also when is she because those are historical events but this is supposedly happened after her life and then who is she is she eve you know is she mary is she israel is she the church I, it's about as far from clear as i can get so I throw my hands up at that point. 
Thank you, Dan. Turton, anything you want to add? Sure, I'll just briefly add. The, the accusation of smoke and mirrors is frankly unwarranted because the contention is about whether or not something is a historical fact. And the absence of the, the, the centuries of silence on this is important to a historical inquiry. Even if you think we would, we would disregard what you know, Ignatius says as an apostolic father, that, that's really aside from the point. The reason we would reject what Ignatius says is whether or not he has support of scripture. Not Now, whether some historical event happened, we, for that we do a historical investigation. It's not the same thing. But anyway, I'll, I, we already used up a lot of our time. Okay, thank you, Turretin, uh, William, and Sam. You guys Sam, get the last I'll, I'll word. Get, yeah, I'll, I'll let Sam okay. respond to that. We get the last word. Uh, two things. Number one, notice how he begs the question. He goes, even if Ignatius taught it, it doesn't matter if it's not supported scripture. But the problem is that the scriptures that he's now using to bash these fathers were actually the scriptures that came through these very bishops appointed by the apostles and preserved by them. So if they couldn't understand that the New Testament rejects the monopiscopacy that means these guys were a bunch of misfits so he ends up becoming a restorationist so he should become a mormon because the church became apostate and secondly dan out of love i say go watch the debate you've grossly misrepresented what we said you did not represent what i said i didn't say that the woman becomes israel or <clears throat> eve or mary when it's convenient if you were being honest and i know you're honest because you fear jesus and you believe he's the god of truth you will see that i said it's eve woman and Mary, because the typology is there that shows it's referring to Eve, <clears throat> Israel, and Mary. And then if you had heard what I said, I said that the reason why she's already to heaven is because this shows that she's destined to reign in heaven with her son. So please stop misrepresenting my arguments. I try not to do that with you. The reason why she's in heaven, though these events are, is because that's showing you that God has destined her like he destined her child to reign in heaven. Just like the child was born on earth, then he went to heaven to reign. Same with the figure. That's only confirming her ultimate destiny. So represent my arguments accurately, my brother. Please. Sam, thank you very much for the final word. Okay, we'll move on to the next question. And the next question comes in from Logan. $10 super, uh, super chat. Appreciate the support. And this time it's a question for the Protestants. Okay, so here's the question. Why do certain Protestant fathers, Luther, Calvin, etc., teach and believe certain Marian doctrines, yet modern-day Protestants don't? Whose interpretation is right and final? Go ahead. Oh, Dan, you might be on mute again. Yeah, You're the yeah, king so of mute. I'll, I'll... <laughs> Yeah, so I apologize. Uh, wasn't sure who was going to go first. Okay, yeah, this is a fair point. So I think once Rome started dogmatizing these doctrines, it became the Protestants rightly put more attention onto it. So I think what was it in 1854, where you have, uh, I guess, the Immaculate Conception was dogmatized, and then in 1950, the Assumption into Heaven was dogmatized. So I think that probably drew a lot of attention. And then so, of course, to that point, we need to, um, need, need to deal with it. Um, the Frankly, the, the early Protestants had bigger fish to fry um, when they're when they're dealing with the nature of justification itself and indulgences and, and on and on and on. So um, you know I'm, I'm not surprised that it you know took a while to hone in on these things, but uh, you know there, there it is from my perspective. Okay, thank you, Dan. Uh, Turton, anything you want to quickly add? The final arbiter of our doctrines is a scripture. That's a central component, not only of the patristic era, and we see dozens and dozens of important fathers in the patristic era affirming the supremacy of scripture for deciding questions of doctrine. But it's also, it's one of the central planks of the Reformation. When somebody like Luther holds over something from his previous views, while he's battling so many other issues on a point that's not even dogma, 
in Roman Catholicism at that time. It, it, it's still hundreds of years away from 1950. It, it wasn't, you didn't have to believe it at that time. Why is that going to be, you know, drawing his main attention? I have no idea. And there are passages in Luther's works, for example, where uh, after some time, he does uh, criticize, well, for one thing, he definitely criticizes the feast. And then there's a question left open. Is he criticizing it because it's detracting in some other way, or is he criticizing it uh, for the underlying reason that the ascension of Mary didn't occur? That's a an, an interesting question for Luther scholars, but ultimately the answer is scripture is our final arbiter, not some one particular uh, guy like Luther. Okay, Turretin, appreciate the response. Uh, William and Sam, the floor is yours. Who do you want to go first, me or you? I can't hear your mute. My bad. Let me go, and then I'll I'll give you I'll give okay. it to you. Okay, let me go uh, very quickly. Uh, we're told that once they became dogmatized, there there was pushback. Th that really, with all due respect, that's nonsense because this was already built into the church life. And let's not forget, the question was in, in terms of the Marian dogmas as a whole. Mary as Theotokos was already dogmatized. Mary's perpetual virginity was dogmatized as well. And they held to them. They didn't deny them. But you're telling me that a dogma would have made them, led them, lead them to deny it? I, I don't see the point. If they begin speaking about them. In fact, Luther calls it lies very fervently when there is a rumor of him spread denying their perpetual virginity. As far as them having bigger fish to fry, well, they wouldn't even talk about believing this if they didn't. And tip of the hat to the real Francis Turretin, who believed in the perpetual virginity. Um, and we're being told that the final arbiter is scripture. Well, if that's the case, tip of the hat to them. They unanimously held to the perpetual virginity. And the early ones, we mentioned Jan Haas, Wycliffe, Luther, and there are many others that believed in the bodily assumption of Mary. Uh, so it's very clear that this is important. Uh, we're told that Luther later in life criticized the feast. I've read the text. He does. Dick Turton said that. But I invite you to read the rest of it. He will tell you that we know Mary is in heaven, but he does criticize the feast because he'll accuse Catholics of being idolaters. He always had negative things to say, but he doesn't deny the assumption even in that criticism. What does that show you? It shows you that well before in 1950, it was built into the life of the church if Luther's already criticizing this official feast day. You know what official feasts are? Those are built into the liturgical life. If it's on a feast day, that's held by the faithful. It's very important to recognize that. Talking about scripture alone, no early father held to that. And we will both debate you in the future on that topic. Book it if you want. Do we have any time or do you took it all up? No, you can go, brother. Definitely. Yeah. Go ahead, okay, follow up. Okay, now notice what's happening, folks. They go, Scripture is the final, final <clears throat> the judge of all matters. What they should have said, no, their interpretation of Scripture, not Scripture, because here they're very reformers reading the Scriptures because they boast about John Calvin being so knowledgeable. He knows Greek and he would know Latin and then Martin Luther would know German. Yet when they read the Scriptures, they don't walk away with the assumption that Mary had children from Joseph. In fact, John Calvin himself chastises my friends for appealing to Helvidius, a heretic, to try to show that there was a segment in Christianity that believed in married children. Here it is. John Calvin's harmony on Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Helvidius displayed excessive ignorance. That means he would say the same of these two gentlemen. In concluding that Mary must have had many sons because Christ's brothers are sometimes mentioned. Moreover, they didn't reason like these gentlemen. Well, scripture is silent that Mary was assumed. And it says generally everyone dies. But there are exceptions. Mary's not that. Even though the scripture didn't come out and say that Mary's assumed, they had no problem with Mary being assumed because they're convinced there was enough data outside of scripture without contradicting scripture. So, no, it's not scripture. It's your interpretation of scripture. That's what we reject. Thank you, Sam. Uh, this time the question was for you, uh, gentlemen, Dan and Turretin. So feel free to get the last word. Go ahead. Oh, sure thing. So one of the places, uh, one of the places that Luther's talking about this, he says, in the first place, there is no sign in scripture of the feast of the ascension of Mary, so that the papists, that's Luther's term, themselves just use a saying from Jerome, who is supposed to have said, I do not know whether she ascended into heaven in her body or out of her body. 
And that's this pseudo Jeromean piece that was taken out in the, in the late 1500s by the Pope. And that was taken out. And that's what, when the, this dogma started to develop traction. It didn't become a dogma yet, but it gained more traction once you take out this pseudo Jeromean warning. And indeed, in the 1200s, one of the popes actually said, the church hasn't decided, so you can take it or leave it, while there was, at that time, the feast. So the idea that the fact that there's a feast there just means everyone has to accept it. Maybe that's true in some Orthodox churches, maybe. I, I'm not going to argue that point, but in, in terms of what the popes have taught, that, that is not the case. If it were, we should be having a debate on the Queen of Heaven title, because there's a feast about that, and there's not a, a corresponding dogma. Okay, thank you, Turtid fan. We'll move on to the next question, unless there's something really quickly you wanted to add, Dan. You're good. Okay, perfect. All right, so next question is now for uh, William and Sam. So we got a good, healthy mix of questions for both sides. And so, okay, here we go. Born Again RN, appreciate the support and the question. Question for Sam and Will. Epiphanius had three theories of Mary, buried, martyred, remained alive. Isn't that all he's saying in Panarian 79? Not that Mary was assumed like Elijah. Panarian 78 says no one knows. Gentlemen, go ahead. Yeah, um, and I'll, I'll go quickly and then I'll let Sam piggyback off it because we've looked at it a number of times and we've done shows on it. I know it's very clear that Epiphanius, who, by the way, is a heresy hunter and does a lot of research. It's very clear, as Shoemaker points out, as Dr. Kutus point out, as Father Daly point out, that in Panarian 78, he very clearly is agnostic as to what happened to Holy Mary. But in 79, when he returns to this question, his final word in this question is that, like the bodies of the saints, talking about Mary, however, she has been held in honor for her character and her understanding. And if I should say anything more in her praise, by the way, we've looked at the Greek, she is like Elijah. I know what people are going to say. Well, how is she like Elijah? You know, it's only the virginity part. Well, let's read it all. Who was virgin from his mother's womb, always remained so. By the way, he held to the perpetual virginity, the way the reformers held to it as well, and was taken up and has not seen death. It's one parallel. She's a perpetual virgin and she's assumed into heaven. She's like John who leaned on the Lord's breast. Now, I know the, the response that uh, born again is going to have. And with all due respect, let's get a little bit serious here. It's very clear the parallels that are here. Like John who leaned on the Lord's breast, well, the Lord leaned on her breast. And the other parallel is the Dormition parallel as you read onward. How do we know that the other parallel is of John's Dormition? Because we're literally told what, what Epiphanius is talking about. It's people that are mortal. The third parallel is with Tecla, and we're told, well, how on earth is there a parallel with Tecla? She was a virtuous virgin. If you read the early writings in the church, you'll find that tradition tells you she was a virtuous virgin. By the way, I know that born again doesn't agree with that particular reading, but to that reading, I point to the overwhelming modern-day scholarship on Epiphanius. Shoemaker, Dr. Katus, and Father Daly, who have all confirmed Shoemaker in a written work. You can pull it up right now. It's for free in academia. Dr. Katus in a show she's done with us and Father Daly in a show that he's done with us confirmed that Epiphanius believed in the bodily assumption of Mary. I'll go with the top door mission scholars any day of the week. Sam, anything to add, brother? No, brother, I was just trying to find the full citation on my blog. I can't, but no, you said enough. If I find it, I'll probably bring it up because... You do have it on your blog. You have it there yeah, on your blog. I can't find it, though, for some reason. I'm using Synth Engine. I have the full citation to correct the misinformation, but you did a good job because you showed that he's desperate in trying to then dislodge the fact that Mary is likened to Elijah, not only in, her, in his virginity, but that <clears throat> he didn't see death implication. That means there's some sense in which... Mary's like Elijah, that she's alive, not dead. And since if Elijah's alive bodily, then she has to be alive bodily. But I know, don't confuse me with facts, my mind is made up already. When I find it, we'll read it in context, maybe the second round. So I'll be looking for it. I don't know why I can't find it. My own article. But go ahead, that they can respond. Okay. Sam, William, appreciate it. 
Dan Turton, floor is yours. Go ahead. Yeah. So I personally, when I first heard this quote, I thought perhaps that this was right. And then, and when I heard, uh, I guess, Gavin Ortland um, uh, present, I wasn't persuaded by his argument. The, the, the piece that Epiphania said that convinced me that no, uh, he's not talking about the bodily assumption of Mary because I, I thought that's where he was going and I was just going to say, okay, well then we have silence for 300 years, not 400 years. But the piece that com convinced me otherwise is the against Vel uh, Velasarians uh, 38, 58, when he said, John and James, the son of Je Je Zebedee, who remained virgin, surely did not cut, off, uh, uh, cut their members off with their own hands and did not uh, uh, contract marriage either. So, well, you know, why is he going there like who you know that that that's that's the piece that really made me start to think and then i then i saw okay the triple parallel the common denominator isn't the other aspects of these folks lives it's the virginity elijah's virginity john's virginity and then uh thecla's virginity so once i once i understood that that epiphanius makes a big point that john was a virgin which i wouldn't even have guessed that he would go there but once i saw that that's that's exactly where Epiphanius goes, and that's what he thinks is notable about John. Um, then I got it. Then I was like, okay, the, yeah, the common denominator between this triple parallel is virginity. It's not bodily assumption. Yeah. Is that my turn? Yeah, you take you take the final word. Yeah, yeah. No, that's actually not the context. This is why I wanted to find that I did it. The context is, if you read, I have it right in front of me. It's on my blog. He's condemning the Coloridians for worshiping her because of how glorious she is. So... I'd like to read the section before, but for the time. I'm going to read it for the audience. Folks, you tell me born again and this brother accurately represented what <clears throat> they claim Epiphanius taught. Here you go. For what this sect has to say is complete nonsense. And as it were, an old wives tale, which scripture has spoken of it, that you bake cakes and deify, right? Okay. Which prophet permitted the worship of a man, let alone a woman? The vessel is choice, but a woman and by nature, no different from others. Like the bodies of saints, however, the bodies of saints, he said virginity. She has been held in honor for her character and understanding. And if I should say anything more in her praise, she is like Elijah, who is virgin from his mother's womb, always reigned so, and was taken up and has not seen death. She is like John, who leaned on the Lord's breast, the disciple whom Jesus loved. She is like Saint Thecla, and Mary still more honored than she, because of the providence vouchsafed her. But Elijah is not to be worshipped, even though he's alive. And John is not to be worshipped, even though by his own prayer, or rather, by receiving the grace from God, he made an awesome thing of his falling asleep. But neither is Thecla worshipped, nor any of the saints. For the life of me, where is he saying that they're virgins, like Mary's a virgin? Well, that's not the point he's making. He's saying, look at these great figures. As great they aren't, no one worships them. Even though more Mary is more glorious than Thecla, she is not to be worshipped. So this is, again, what happens when you don't go to the primary sources. So I encourage you, Protestants, don't take my word or their word for go read it. I have it. That's not the comparison. It's clearly she's like Elijah, a virgin who is not dead. And like John, in that John, leaned on Jesus's breast, but she did John one better. She carried Jesus in her womb. Guys, let's be honest with the sources. Donnie, I hope I didn't uh, speak over Turton fans' opportunity to respond. Uh, no, well, it, it was a question for uh, um, Sam and Will. So basically, they, they got the last word. Why did, was there something you wanted to add, Dan, that you didn't get the opportunity to, you're saying? No, it's okay. We can, we can continue on it. It's all right. Okay. Yeah. All right. Appreciate it, uh, gentlemen. Great comprehensive answers all around. Okay, so next question comes in for the Protestant side. $10 super chat. Delil. Longman Carson Squiddy. I can't say I understand what that part means, but the next part says for the Protestant side, why are y'all using fathers for your case against the assumption, but reject the same fathers when it comes to the perpetual virginity? Go ahead. I'm happy to take the first uh, cut at this one. So I appreciate that it probably looks inconsistent. And I, I can appreciate that because, you know, we spend a lot of time talking about how various fathers explicitly teach against the assumption. 
we talk about how there's silence on the assumption and so forth. And then you think we're actually making the fathers the standard of truth. Or we talk about how all these fathers, you know, t teach one way about Revelation 12. Uh, we're ready to talk about Revelation 11 and Psalm 132, all the usual texts. But of course, we're not saying that they're the standard of truth. On this, in this particular topic, we're focusing on the fact that if the bodily assumption were a true event that actually happened and that was passed down in Christian tradition, it would have left some traces. This is not a phantom tradition that just pops into existence, but is true. Either if it were true, there would have been evidence of it during those centuries of silence. And because there's not evidence of that, we realize that it is something that was made up. It's fiction. You might think of it like fan fiction, but it is nevertheless fiction. It's not something that actually happened. Now, that said, we do also consider what the fathers had to say on topics like the perpetual virginity, and we recognize what they say. And, and I even respond to people like Jerome, who you know attacks Helvidius. And I answer Calvin, who tries to support Jerome on that point. I'm happy to do so. That's not the issue. The issue is, in this particular case, that not that we're citing the fathers, that they're infallible and they can never be wrong, or even when they're all together, they, they're always... When they're united, they're always right, or something like that. That's not that's not the argument we're making. We're, we're pointing out that the evidence of the fathers demonstrates, first of all, that the interpretation of Revelation 12 is not obviously the modern interpretation, but also, more importantly, that this event that is alleged to have taken place in history just didn't happen in history. Okay, thank you, Turretin. Uh, Dan, was there anything you wanted to quickly add, or are we going to hand it over to... William and Sam. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I echo what uh, Turn and Pets had said just real briefly. Yeah. So when we look at the fathers, it's they're, they're important. They are authorities, but not infallible authorities. But we're looking mostly from a historical claim standpoint in a debate like this. And we're not looking at it through the eyes of, um, you know, trying to read it, read back in um, into a backdrop behind these authorities that this is a revealed doctrine coming from the apostles because that's that's certainly there's just not enough historical evidence to show that okay i appreciate it dan uh william and sam floor is yours go ahead real quickly l let me show you what's uh, taking place right here when you can demonstrate historically a doctrine is universal virtually unanimous <clears throat> still that's not good enough to establish it's early <clears throat> it's ancient and none of these fathers who gave us the very scriptures these men are now using against them because they keep forgetting these fathers were not idiots. They were not buffoons. Many of them actually read the scriptures in their mother tongue in Greek. They're the ones copying the scriptures. They're the ones preserving the scriptures. They're the ones who are being killed for the scriptures. I don't know. I don't think I even lost a hair follicle for the scriptures. They're the ones who know the scriptures. They're commenting on the scriptures. And when they are virtually unanimous about a doctrine like the perpetual virginity or the monarchical episcopate, these gentlemen then come and still reject their virtual unanimous testimony because of their interpretation of scripture. But then it gets worse. Then you bring in the reformers who had a beef with the Catholic Church, but they had no problem still affirming the perpetual virginity. And yet they knew the languages because John Calvin was a lawyer who's supposedly outstanding, who wrote the Institutes of the Christian Religion, and Martin Luther was this beast when it comes to theology. And they read the same scriptures and still concluded, no, Mary did not have children. She is a perpetual virgin. And then when their Protestant descendants come and say, well, hey, us who? Or they say nonsense, baloney. These arguments are pathetic. So it's not scripture. It's your tradition, your uninspired, fallible interpretation, because it's not an issue of infallibility. You're no more infallible than they are. So why should we bow to you and ignore what came before? Go ahead, brother. Yeah, no, I echo everything you said and, 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 and add one very clear point there, that today there was a very clear proceedings laid forth. We dealt primarily with Revelation 12. We parked the bus there and dealt with it. That was the main opening. That's why Sam opened with that. We utilized the fathers in a supplementary fashion. We were asked, well, who was the earliest that interpreted Revelation 12 in a Mariological way? Well, we gave them a few of those. And then they came back and said, aha, well, they didn't interpret it as being uh, the assumption. Well, then when you ask us to give it give you assumption text we tell you what the scholars say we quote the early fathers and not even that is good enough and then we tell you how the early reformers the 
so-called beacons of light for the first performers like Ian Haas, Wycliffe, believed in this. That isn't good enough. We tell you Luther believed it. That isn't good enough. So we quote Bullinger, Zwingli, and on and on and on. That isn't good enough. At the end of the day, it is their personal interpretation that they want you to rely upon. Today, we want you to look at the very clear reading of the Bible and then look at how the early fathers interpreted that very clear reading of the Bible. By the way, a great topic for a future dialogue would be the queenship of Mary and how the early fathers tied that in with Mary being bodily assumed. But I, I don't want to talk too long. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Sam and William. This question is for uh, you gentlemen, Dan and Turretin fans, so feel free, have the last word. So this is a bit of a red herring. They don't have a good answer. The, the assumptionists don't have a good answer for the centuries of silence. So they point out that even if the centuries of silence were full of testimonies, then we wouldn't accept it. And that's that may very well be true, that we wouldn't accept it if there weren't, but that doesn't answer the question. There's a reason why there's centuries of silence. And that's because the truth is nobody was teaching this doctrine. And the truth is there was no tradition of it during that time. And the result of those things is that it just isn't true that it happened. The assumption didn't happen in the first century as these myths claim. And the, the, the scriptural argument that was offered, I, th I think you heard how it was taken apart. And I kind of leave it to the people to go back and listen and hear how we disassembled the attempted argument from scripture. Okay, thank you very much, Turretin. Dan, was there anything quickly you wanted to add? Okay, we're good to go. Um, okay, here we go. Next one. So we're down to our last three. The last three are for question again. Sam and William. I love them. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> it's, uh, it's basically the same question, but repackaged by Bill. Yeah, it's all right. It does look very similar to the previous okay, one. Okay, hey, as so long as he's giving you money, hey, go uh, for it. Go ahead. <laughs> Let's take your last three super chats. You can deal with this because I, I said my part, but go ahead, brother. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Same question, repackaged, but go ahead. <laughs> let me. Okay, let here me. we go. So, Kelly sorry, Powers, question for Sam and William. No worries. If this assumption of Mary is essential for the faith, exam, uh, example salvation, why did it take the RCC to 1950 to make this a dogma to be saved? A uh, very, very quick answer. You don't want to take a whole lot of time up because it is a very easy answer. Uh, the Pope was very clear that he wanted to give the world very, very beautiful hope by bringing forth something that was already believed from the beginning, already built into the liturgy, after World War II, after the world was after the world was wrecked by World War II, and you can read the very document, Munificentissimus Deus, where he tells you, look, he quotes early liturgies. He says, look, this has been believed from the beginning. Quoting the liturgies and telling you the world is wrecked right now. People have go going through tumultuous times. So he says this has been this was divinely revealed. The church, and he notes how all of the apostolic churches believe this. So this was already built into the liturgy. It was elevated to the status of a dogma, but believed well before 1950, made a dogma then because of the particular events that were going on in the world. So if I can just add one clarification. Sure. So basically, yeah. William, so people understand how dogma works. Yeah. Something that's dogmatized at one point doesn't mean it wasn't affirmed and necessary for belief prior. Am that's I correct. Okay. You are so correct. Just yeah. Okay. Just want to make sure because they're thinking if it's not written in stone, then therefore no. that means people were free to reject it, even though it would have been part of the living teaching <clears throat> magisterium of the church. Yeah, you have but a problem you, then. You reject nice, it yeah. if it was yeah. taught as part of the church? Right, it's a great point there, because then we would then say that, well, the Council of Nicaea dogmatized Christ being Lord. Did that Was that not believed beforehand? Of course it was believed before. It's biblical. It was taught by the early church fathers. Just because it was dogmatized in the fourth century, which is relatively late, doesn't mean that it wasn't believed and it wasn't built into the teaching of the faith before that. Okay, thank you guys. Uh, Dan and Turton, did you have any thoughts on this specific question? Sure. So the Council of Nicaea and, and basically the, the Trinity and Christology, those are 
there's this superficial in scripture that Christ is God and that sort of thing. So people had that, but you know, reconciling divine simplicity with the incarnation might have taken the church some time to work out. But the assumption of Mary isn't like that because it's a historical event. It either happened or it didn't. It's kind of straightforward from from that standpoint. But what I found interesting is the vastly different approach that we heard tonight from um, Sam and William than what I've heard from other Roman Catholic apologists. For example, Trent Horn just uh, goes ahead and just says, yeah, you know, we, ne we need to rely on papal authority for things like the Assumption of Mary. And then also, uh, even more interesting, and to your point, uh, Brian, perspective, is the debate, uh, uh, Robert Syngenesis' approach, he straightforwardly bases the Assumption of Mary based on the Marian apparitions, especially the one that happened in France. So, um, you know, that he gives he gives a reason as to why it happened in 1950. But, you know, it's interesting the wildly different approaches we see from Roman Catholic apologists. Okay, thank you, Dan. Yeah, so yeah. Sam Willen, you guys get the last word. Turn, you want to say something before I can? Let, let, let me briefly, very quickly say. Wait, um, let, let's see if Turin, wait, 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 well, maybe Turin. Oh, my bad, Turton. Yeah, I'm sorry, my friend. Yeah, let him know. I you appreciate want to add anything, Turton? Very kind of you. The, the I just wanted to clarify the exact wording that Pius the Twelfth used it, right after his definition. The very next uh, number forty four is the definition. Number forty five, he says, "Hence, if anyone, which God forbid, should dare, dare willfully to deny or to call into doubt that which we have defined, let him know that he has fallen away completely from the divine and Catholic faith." And my contention is he has absolutely no scriptural warrant for do saying that, and he has absolutely no traditional basis for thinking that this is a divinely revealed truth. Notice the words willfully, and notice how today we very clearly laid out that biblical basis. So we ask people to just rewind and hear the debate over, and you will clearly note that very strong biblical basis that we laid forth, but I want to give it, hand it over to Sam, uh, and I'll piggyback if I need to. Folks, I want you to hear what is said because I think my brothers don't understand the implication of their own arguments. And I pray in Jesus' name that he illuminates all of us by his spirit. Notice the Trinity, the deity of Christ, is clearly taught in scriptures that Jesus is God, not the Father, not the Spirit. And yet they just admit it took centuries for them to hammer out and articulate the precise exact relationships between Father, Son, and Spirit and the two natures. It didn't come overnight. Now, guys, put on your thinking back. If something that's so well attested, as such as the two natures of Christ and the Trinity, so well attested, still took time for Christians to argue and fight, even come to blows to get down the position of the language, such, so they're doing you know, understanding. Why are they shocked that the Assumption of Mary may have taken some <clears throat> later time to be defined, understood, and developed, especially when I just said, that the book of Revelation, which came the basis for that doctrine, was called in dispute for centuries before it's canonized. So thank you for making our case. Because something that is not as well attested in Scripture, we would expect it would take longer for someone to then come to the right conclusion, guided by the Spirit. But something so well attested in Scripture, you just admit that. It was centuries before they came up with monothelitism or diathelitism and diaphysitism. But does that mean that prior to those formulations someone could deny that jesus is eternally god and not become a heretic because it wasn't codified be consistent my brothers okay thank you for the last word there sam and william uh last two questions so the next one comes in from born again rn so it looks like we're getting a an impromptu q a two verse two kelly and steve versus william and sam so you should bring okay. them on if he, if he, if you want to come on born again you should Set bring them in with him Come on. Yeah, you bring them there in. There we go. Two verse two, epic showdown. Okay, okay gentlemen, here we go. Anthony, so, by the way, here, born again. Ask Anthony Rogers to join you. Let's do a two on two, you and Anthony. Hey, you've been you doing guys. shows with him. Come on. Two yeah, let's do it. Two. You know you've got a great moderator. Anthony has here no in reason not to back down. We're calling great you Great moderator up. here in Donnie. I'll Donnie make sure the debate's good. professional, just like this Ooh, one. Baby. And Donnie, no I want to ask you something. I want to go at uh, our brothers, and I mean this. You are the most professional and the yeah. best moderator, man. I mean that. I oh, love man. the way you're. You're excellent. God bless you and preserve you and fill you with I the agree. spirit of Christ. I agree. I, I do appreciate uh, that, gentlemen. It really has been a privilege and an honor to host this debate, a debate of this caliber. So appreciate the kind words. Okay, so here we go. 
we'll work through this together. So Steve is asking, if this dogma was believed in the early church, can you address Dr. Gavin Ortland? Hopefully I pronounced that one right. Producing 24 separate ECF lists, mentioning numerous people assumed to have been. None mentioned Mary, question mark. Yeah, let me reply to that uh, by noting uh, that Gavin Ortland does not produce 24 different lists of people listing people that are assumed into heaven. What Gavin Ortland does there is show you how early fathers talk about the translation of Enoch and Elijah. And then he will say, well, you know, they don't mention Mary, so they didn't believe in the assumption of Mary. By the way, if you don't think that I've looked at them, I've looked at all of them. And we have a reply coming very soon. I've looked at Tertullian, Irenaeus against Heresies 5, Methodius Discourse in the Resurrection 3, Origen Commentary in Romans, the Holy Apostles, Chrysostom, Cyril. I've looked at them all. And even Tertullian, in case I didn't mention it, who was not a church father, but there's no such thing as all of these 24 lists of people mentioning those that are assumed into heaven. That is bunk. That is baloney. It is put out there to confuse you and to blow you away. You're like, whoa, 24 different lists and you never find Mary. I would recommend what you do is you fact check. Go to the list. Go to, you can find almost, almost all of them. I think almost all on New Advent. And then go to look at what Gavin is quoting from being very selective and people talking about Enoch and Elijah being translated to heaven. Some of them talking about them because they have to come back and die. They believed Tertullian is not making a list of those assumed that is exclusively assumed. No, he's telling you, we all have to die. Even Enoch and Elijah who were assumed are going to return to die. He was one of those that held to that theory, but they're not making exclusive lists of those assumed in heaven. So I don't think that that's a good argument from Dr. Ortland at all. And again, an argument from silence. Give me a father that flat out denies the bodily assumption of Mary. Let's talk about that. Give me meat and potatoes. Find me one that denies it. We heard of Jacob of Sarug earlier talking about the soul only, but it wasn't the case. Even the top scholar of Jacob, Dr. Brock, affirms to you that is a bodily assumption there. And you want to talk about councils? Even though it was a local one, the Council of Nisibis was an important one. There he produced that sermon full of bishops teaching the bodily assumption of Mary. Thank you, uh, William and Sam. Any thoughts, Dan and Turretin? I would welcome any documentation at all about this Council of Nisibis. As far as I can tell, and I think one of the scholars on your program said the same thing, that he was only aware of the council from the note in the in the document. The idea that there was even more than one bishop there is really nothing that we can uh, attest to. And if they did anything more than just read the, the homily there, and of course, as Dan has pointed out, this is a homily that doesn't include the bodily assumption of Mary. So uh, as for the issue of silence, the silence is the thing that's hard to explain. Yes, I, I, we can appreciate that there are times when some of the elements of this list of occasions when people are talking about Elijah and Enoch, maybe some of them it's inappropriate to mention Mary. Maybe some of them are talking about just Old Testament believers, or maybe some of them are talking about people who are assumed, and maybe you, you could hypothesize that the person thought that Mary was uh, died and was raised again, and therefore these uh, Elijah and Enoch models are, don't fit Mary. Maybe you could say that, but there's plenty of, there's so many places where they, she could be mentioned and isn't mentioned that there's a need to explain the answer in terms of why wasn't this, why wasn't something mentioned? And the, the short answer is that the reason it wasn't mentioned is because they didn't know about it. They, like Epiphanius, had not heard this from a reliable source. And in fact, in uh, Michael O'Carroll's Theotokos, under the Assumption Apocrypha section, he, said, he, he talks about the theology in this, and he says, the emphasis on the apostles as witnesses of the death and Assumption of Mary may suggest that the belief was of apostolic origin. In the immense scholarly research which preceded the promulgation of the dogma, attempts to trace such a link were not successful. This approach was abandoned. And 
instead of abandoning the dogma because you couldn't find apostolic tradition, they just abandoned the research. That's that's unfortunately where we are. This isn't an apostolic tradition and it wasn't passed down. That's why there's silence in all those lists. So just to- Okay, so um, Dan, we'll go you and then we'll hand it back to William and Sam. So Dan, go ahead. Sure, so William, since you are preparing an episode, maybe you throw this in because you challenged, okay, so who's denying this? And I did find at least one. Um, so this is uh, from uh, 1085. This is uh, as a Caracius, and it's from Mignes Patrology, volume 99, and it's on page uh, 1234. Could, could you tell me that name again? I apologize. I don't want to take your time, but what that what was that yeah. name? It's called he's called Bishop Asacarius, and he's from 1085. And here's oh, what he says. Oh, I know who you're talking. Never mind. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I got you. I know what you're talking about. So here's what it says. So nor should I be silent about this that they do not blush uh, or fear to weakly chatter about the glorious ever virgin mother of our Lord Jesus Christ, Mary, that she suffered a very common death in the sight of men and her body to this day rests in the tomb and is seen by many. Okay. So, now, yeah. William, if you want, address that and give me a few seconds. I want to show again the inconsistency, but go ahead. You can just yeah, wait. There we go. Say. Here we go. So let me... Pull up. Give me one second because, okay, number one, uh, bishops oversee councils. That's very clear. That's a very important point that has to be made. And we're told that uh, this council, well, actually, we're told that uh, Jacob of Sarug didn't teach the bodily assumption of Mary. Yet I very clearly brought up the very top scholar in the world on Jacob of Sarug and we're told, still being told, that he didn't teach it. And now I want to offer a little bit of pushback there. They didn't read it for us. It is not present in Shoemaker's book. I've mentioned that over and over and over. I've mentioned it. Indeed, I think a very important point is that you don't find it there in Shoemaker's book. We're told that it wasn't present there, but let me briefly read while Sam looks up something, then I'll, I'll hand it over to him. Um, Jacob of Sarug actually says, the mother of the king enters the bridal chamber of light. Heaven was full of the sweet music of the angels, but the depths were troubled together with the disciples who were filled with grief. The church on high and that below cried out with one hymn, for neither those above nor those below could suffice to tell of her. The ranks of that exalted assembly cried out from this one to that one, that they might shout their praises. The air dropped living rain on the bones of the sons of the church. And it's talking about all of these events as he imagines they happen as Holy Mary enters into heaven but we're told there's no assumption into heaven only her death no there is an assumption she's entering into heaven i'm reading the very quote where it even says she wove a beautiful crown and set it on her sublime head those very words we read we read those very words to to dr brock by the way that show will be airing in a few days subdeacon read them and we asked him what is going on here because some people by the way people don't argue that there's no assumption some people were trying to argue there's only the sole assumption into heaven in Jacob. We asked Dr. Brock point blank, and you guys can come back and say, you guys are liars if you watch the show and he doesn't say it. We asked him, does Jacob teach a bodily assumption of Mary into heaven? And he affirms that yes, he does. This is a top scholar on Jacob of Saru. And this is the actual quote given at the Council of Nisibus. As far as that bishop goes, I, I, if you could give me that name again, I'm pretty sure that this is a bishop that is referring to that pseudonymous work that was attributed to uh, Pascasius Radbertus, but it wasn't him. Uh, I'll look it up right now and maybe before the show ends. You said it's in the Patrologia. What volume was that? Uh, so it's in it's in volume 99. It's page uh, 1234. His name is Asacarius. How do you, and, how do you spell that? Uh, a a-S-C-A-R-I-S-C-U-S. And I just sent you a link in the private chat. Okay, and okay. you want page 12, uh, okay. 34. I, for the audience, real quick, I'm almost positive. But if I'm wrong, I'll say it before the show ends. I'm pretty certain that's referring to a pseudonymous work that was previously attributed to Pascasius. But I could be wrong. I'll say it before the show's over. I want to give uh, Sam, you were going to say something, right? Yeah. I just, again, I want to highlight. And again, I pray the Holy Spirit illuminates all of us and guides us to the truth. Did you hear what Tritton said, that when there was opportunity to speak about Mary's assumption, 
complete silence. And then he said in his exchange, that's the silence is deafening. This is about a method that we're called to serve the God of truth. So we need to be honest in our methodology. Notice again, the inconsistency. The Bible has so much to say about justification. It has so much to say about sanctification. It has so much to say about salvation. And yet Turretin, if his salvation was dependent on it, cannot show you, he cannot show you <clears throat> the view that he holds to sola fide as defined, so I don't get misrepresented because I know people have butchered the fathers, take them out of context with the shows showing the shameless butchering of their statement sola fide, defining sola fide the way Martin Luther did, nor can he find in the second century, third century, fourth century, their belief in limited atonement, nor can he find prior to Augustine their denial of human free will. And yet the Bible has so much to say on it, and yet they still didn't conclude this is what the Bible teaches. So why are you a Calvinist? And why are you an evangelical if you're going to be honest with your methodology? That's my advice to you. Be consistent because you serve the God of truth. All right, gentlemen, appreciate the final word. And we've now made it to the final question for tonight. I really do appreciate all the time that our guests tonight on the panel have given to us nearly four hours for this epic debate. Time has flown by. This has been very yeah. edifying. I truly By the way, Donnie, for you, yep. I extended my live stream for another 30 minutes so I can do my errands because I love you. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, I appreciate that. You guys are, are awesome. You guys all made for an awesome debate. I, I'm yeah. already looking forward to re-listening to this. So, okay, here we go. Born Again RN, final question of the night. $10 super chat. Thank you for the support. Question for Sam and Will. Isn't Ephraim using carried away the same way Jesus described Lazarus being carried away, meaning spiritually? Luke 16, 22, not bodily. Go ahead, guys. Yeah, let me um, let me pull that up. Uh... Yeah, let me uh, just for the sake of being able to have the quote on hand. Uh, I apologize uh, that I closed that out. Uh, I didn't think the Ephraim question would come up again, but no, uh, that is not what Ephraim uh, is doing. Ephraim very clearly is talking about Mary being taken up uh, into heaven. And here you go. So the actual quote in Ephraim is very clear and in the context, as we saw earlier, to a great height he lifted me with my saints so that I might glorify him in the broad and vast heaven full of his glory. Now we didn't only mention that one. So we brought up that one and pointed out, he's very clearly talking about Mary in heaven, but there's more. We also pointed out that Ephraim also says, let heaven sustain me in its embrace because I am honored above it for heaven was not thy mother, but you have made it your throne. By the way, uh, a lot of the, these quotes that we're looking at very clearly are indicative, excuse me, of the bodily. How much more honorable and venerable in the throne of the king is her mother? And in another place, we read, as we read earlier when I was talking to Turretin fan, where he literally tells you she's the queen of heaven, majestic and heavenly maid, lady, queen, protect and keep me under your wing, lest Satan, the sower of destruction, glory over me. Uh, this is a prayer uh, to Mary. So no, there, there's no possible way that he's talking about being carried away. He's talking about her being in heaven. By the way, let me let me correct what he's saying yeah. here because in Luke where it says that Lazarus is carried away by the angels to Abraham's bosom, notice he begs the question. He assumes that in the context of Ephraim, her being taken to heaven has to be spiritual because he has a passage where Lazarus is clearly taken to Abraham's bosom spiritually because he died. The burden of proof is on you, born again RN, to show that Ephraim meant it, meant it spiritually, not physically. You don't go hijack scripture as is your wont to do, take it out of context, and then misread the statement of scripture and then impose it on a later writer who didn't even tell you that he had Luke 16 in mind. The burden of proof is on you. That's the honest thing to do. Show us where Ephraim said it was spiritual, not physical, just because you found something in Luke that says Lazarus was taking, taken in a spirit, not his body to Abraham's bosom. But nice try of shifting the burden of proof. I give you A for that. Yeah. Okay, thank you guys. Over to the um, negative side, Dan and Turretin. Go ahead. So I think that he raised a good point in terms of the imagery that's used 
in the story of the rich man and Lazarus. Lazarus, it says uh, he, he was full of sores. It says that it came to pass, uh, Luke 16, 22, that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. And then you have all of the, in this scenario where Lazarus is clearly dead, he's being carried off and he's going to Abraham's bosom. And there he there's this interaction, including a request to dip his finger in water and cool the tongue of the rich man. Now, I understand there was some comment about uh, this woman in heaven has her crown and she, she has these bodily characteristics. Someone could say exactly the same thing about Lazarus and the rich man in this story. But of course, we know from the context of the story that these are dead people. Not There's not, no reason to re interpret these as uh, bodily assumed people, even with the phrase carried away. And I would just add as a, as a minor aside, something that's a little bit bothering me throughout, which is I would encourage uh, William to go back and listen when he gets a chance to the rebuttal from the negative side, because we actually did take Shoemaker's book. We put it on the screen. We highlighted the portion where he actually refers to this. And then we scrolled down and showed you Appendix F, where in English he has the translation there, which includes the section we're talking about. So I, I think you may have just missed that or, or something like that. But I just wanted to make it clear to you that we have actually shown that during this debate. Thank you, Turretin. Dan, was there anything you wanted to add? Um, no, uh, thanks. I, no, I, I agree um, with the general point. And, uh, you know, if we keep going too long, we'll, we'll all get carried away here. Yeah. By the way, well, if you want to address the shoemaker part, then I'll end it with my Yeah, comment. let me address that very briefly. Um, no, I don't agree. I still don't agree. And uh, Shoemaker doesn't provide a translation of that. So, of course, I'm not going to agree. Um, he doesn't provide that translation. It is not in there. Uh, I'll go back and look at it. Uh, I've read it tons of times. Uh, but let us say, let me give it to uh, you guys for a moment. Let me say that you all did read it. How on earth did you miss that there's an assumption there if you read it? Because the shame is not on me if I'm wrong and it's in there. Shame on you that you didn't notice it has a bodily assumption. That you read it and you still said, oh, there's no bodily assumption there. Because if you really did read it and you still didn't extrapolate that, we got a bigger problem there. By the way, the show was not going to end without me addressing that bishop that you brought up. And I'm glad you gave me the Patrologia. This is, let me make one comment before I, and I'll give it to Sam afterwards. Here's why I love debating Turton, Tan, and Dan. These guys are no jokes. They will give you where they get the sources. They do this in real time. That is why I tell people there are a lot of people out there that try to attack the Marian dogmas that I think are a joke that they don't do, they don't deal with real scholarship. I know when we come into the arena with both of them, they're gonna deal with real material. These guys even gave me the Patrologia Minie in real time. I tip my hat to that. But what I don't tip my hat to is that the bishop that you quoted, if you read the commentary there, is a heretic. You got no problem with the heretic denying the bodily assumption, was condemned by the Pope. So read the commentary down there. You can have all the heretics you want. We'll keep those that are part of the apostolic church. You can even have Helvidius, a heretic. So sure. that's in that link he sent you that says he's a heretic? Yep, sure is. It's right down there. He was condemned by, by uh, the Pope. And, okay. and they, can, they can look at it right now in real time. Dan just sent me that link. And read he didn't the read that part? Probably did not. You can read oh. that description right yeah. now. May the Lord convict us all to repent and be men of integrity. Final point. Notice the switch and bait. Here, born again RN was talking about Ephraim. What did he do? He took Luke 16 to try to make it somehow parallel to Revelation 12. That was not the question in Turretin. He was talking about Ephraim. So you're comparing apples and pineapples. He was trying to show that Ephraim is talking about Mary being carried away the same way Lazarus was. So let me destroy that argument, born again Aaron. Read your Bible better. It says Lazarus died. So that's number one we know. And it says he was taken Abraham's bosom. Last time I checked, Abraham's bosom was in heaven because if you go to Hebrews, heaven is only open up to the saints when Jesus ascended and by sacrifice opened the gates and then taking the souls of those that were in Abraham's bosom to be with him in glory before their father. Hebrews 12, 22 to 24. So no, it backfires against you and born again are in. Show me where Ephraim is alluding to Luke 16, the burns on you, not on us. Stop with these miscitations. It's embarrassing as Christians. 
who are called to serve the God of truth. We owe our Lord much better than sloppy miscitations. May the Lord have mercy on us and convict us to repent. We're done. Amen. All right, guys, that concludes the audience Q&A, a very thorough audience Q&A. And I want to thank our excellent audience tonight for being so engaged in this debate. Lots of passion on both sides, but I do want to thank my chat mods for keeping order in the chat as best as possible. As always, we want to be respectful to our guests who give us their time for these debates, this debate specifically going four hours and flying by. Just so comprehensive as a debate on, on this topic, the assumption of Mary uh, should be. So seriously, uh, William, Sam, Dan, Turretin, I greatly appreciate the time that, that you've given all of us for this debate, as well me. as just being willing to engage in this debate on, on the Standing for Truth debate platform. So why don't we get just some quick final words, final thoughts. Uh, Turretin, Dan, let's start with you and, and a final flex, Sam. So <laughs> Dan and Turretin, there we go. We'll start with you, uh, gentlemen. Thank you so much for doing this. This really was a great debate. So let's get some final words, final thoughts. Okay, uh, so thank you guys. It, it's been a it's been a pleasure. I appreciate your uh, approach here. Obviously, we have um, strong dif differences here, some some strong disagreement, but that's um, that's to be expected in a debate setting like this. But I appreciate your method and approach and demeanor, and uh, you know that that hasn't gone that's not lost on me. And uh, thank you to Donnie for having me back. Somehow he keeps bringing me back. I appreciate that. I don't know, <laughs> but it's uh, it's been it's always my pleasure to uh, to be on your channel and, um, and and engage in like debates like this. Obviously, there's lots of points that I want to go back and follow up on um, in a debate like this, which is important. And that's you know I'm going to take that away from this. But um, anyways, I no need to re-debate re the debate. Um, so I just wanted to express my gratitude. Thank you very much, Dan. Yeah, Turretin, go ahead. I, I would also like to express my appreciation. I do. I know these do get to be passionate debates, and I've actually heard some of the additional passion on the shows where we're not debating, <laughs> and uh, you know the, the the strong views that are held. I appreciate people uh, being, uh, you know, as cordial as we can be within the context of a debate, and uh, I do appreciate the fact that, uh, Donnie, clearly you need to turn these from being three-hour events into like 30 or 40-hour events. <laughs> so we don't have to worry about time. I'm uh, just kidding, of course. But I really do appreciate your time as well in organizing these. I know it's a, a lot of work, and I, I really appreciate it. Well, it's well, my pleasure. Me, Go ahead, Sam. Let me last I got to run out because I got sure. Yeah, I got to run too, guys. I'm just going to say really quick, God bless you all. I got to go. My daughter's going to knock yeah, my head in. So Lovely be party. By the way, in 50 minutes, if you want to join me, William, come. But my I will. Word, I'll be there. Right, okay. Right. My final words is phenomenal time. I really love your channel, Donnie. I don't just say that. If you've ever heard me, I recommend your channel because I thank Jesus Christ, my Lord, for you. Your ministry is important for all Christians because we got abandoned this nonsense. I don't want to offend people that Mac revolution is compatible with scientific fact and correct mm -hmm. biblical interpretation. I'm sorry. I'm not buying it. You deny the sister of Genesis and Adam and Eve. We got problems, but God have mercy on you nonetheless. So may God strengthen your channel. The Lord preserve you, give you much more wisdom to annihilate the live Mac revolution, to protect our children so they know that biblical creation is a fact and the God of Scripture is real. And I had a blast. Lord willing, if God puts in your heart, I wouldn't mind to do a marathon refuting anti-Trinitarian, something we agree on. So Lord is risen. I love you guys. And God bless you, Dan. And God bless you, Thurton. You are a credit to your tradition. And the Lord preserve you as well for his glory. I got one. God bless you. Thank you very much. There's two things we agree on. We're not related to strawberries and the Trinity is true. So, okay, we're down to the three of us. I am going to uh, shut things down after one quick reminder. This essentially concludes a week long series of main events. So it has been an epic week. We started the week off on Monday with a five and a half hour open mic showdown, Sam, myself and Kent. We engage the critics, the skeptics, and the evolutionary community for five and a half hours. I highly recommend people check that out. Then we had an epic debate between Pastor Scott Clem, C.J. Cox, 
on the controversial but important topic. Is there a geopolitical future for national Israel? Last night, we had a wild one between uh, Dr. Robertson Janice and Taylor from the Snake Was Right YouTube channel, geocentrism. So that one was a ton of fun. And of course, tonight, our main, main event, the epic two verse two showdown on the Assumption of Mary, Dan Chapa and Turretin fan versus William Elbrecht and Sam Shamoon. This was an excellent debate. At one point during the debate, we had over 1,100 people watching between both channels. So that tells me there was a lot of excitement for this debate, and all four of you did not let us down. And so with that, uh, thanks for tuning in. Standing for Truth is out, and God bless all.